The Lost Ship, The Everin Chronicles 2, Prequel, written by Adair Hart, narrated by Michael Wolfe. Chapter 1 M wiped mustard off his robotic body as he detected that he was the only artificial intelligence in a space diner that was over 200 million light years from Earth. It was November 4th, 404-890 A.D., 1 o'clock p.m., and traveling to faraway places in space and time wasn't unusual, but dropping condiments on his chest was. He didn't need to project a hologram around him in a place packed with aliens of many types who would have no idea what a human was. Although he was a cosmic energy orb in a robot body, he could fly out, but that was not needed at the moment. Across from him in the booth sat Everin, a being who appeared human but possessed cosmic energy, the most powerful of all exotic energies like M. Everin and M traveled through space, time, and beyond in Everin's ship, the Toravada, helping those in need. They had decided to visit an interesting civilization and now hung out at a diner near the spaceport where the Toravada had landed. Everin had fair skin with a slight tan. His black hair was pushed up front and on the sides it was combed back. He had blue eyes and a chiseled jawline with the outline of stubble that started at his ears and met on his chin and went up around his mouth. Per M's attractiveness algorithm, Everin would be considered handsome. His advanced one-piece suit was made up of several layers. The first was a black mesh that clung to his athletic build. The second layer was a light gray material that had golden borders and covered certain areas like his chest and upper outer arms, his shoulders, forearms, collar, belt, and boots were covered by white striped lightly armored pads. His belt also had multiple items on it. Each forearm had a personal support device, or PSD. They used dimensional mechanics, a technology that allowed something to exist in a dimension outside this reality, that allowed the PSD to shoot stun, mist, repulsion, grappling, and heat beams. M had the same on his body. M pointed at the dish before Everin. Your food item looks like a hamburger. Everin dipped his head to look at his plate. I guess it does. Although we don't need to eat, you ordered an Earth-like item. It would seem so. Everin gestured at M's chest. You got a hot dog, and it looks like half of it is on you. M looked down. It was more slippery than anticipated. That, or you put too much mustard on it. Perhaps so. M studied him. You're thinking of Earth. Maybe we should go there. We will, said Everin. My old form could show very restrictive emotions. A half smile here or there, or even a slight frown. This new form is much more expressive, even with limited emotions. M had been studying Everin ever since they had died, then reformed into their current incarnations. Although M could view the video history feed of V, M's previous incarnation, he had not ascribed any emotions to them. However, he did have an algorithm that could simulate what they would be. In conjunction with his orb, he could feel emotions. Everin was different in that his previous incarnation's memories existed as is. Per M's assessment, he was depressed, even if it looked like he never was. Whenever the Torvada issued a summons, Everin and M would travel to the point in space and time that was defined. They would then deal with whatever was specified, or if it was vague, they would seek to discover why they were needed there. Instead of going back to Earth where their previous forms had spent much of their time, they had been on over ten summonses outside of Earth since their reformation. My analysis indicates you're avoiding Earth, said M. I'm not. However, I want to make sure I have control of this form, said Everin. M smiled. 
You're Everin, a powerful cosmic being. This would be a trivial operation for you. Everin eyed him. Thanks for the pep talk. Acknowledged. Em raised his hand and extended it. Everin grinned as he high-fived him. Good to see some things haven't changed. Em got an alert. The Torvada is indicating that a group of security guards are trying to move it. Everin's face returned to its emotionless, neutral state as he stood. Then we must go. Emma hopped up, and they took to the air and flew down a connecting street. The soles of Everin's boots were pads that used dimensional mechanics. Emma had the same, but only when he was not using density control. When they had landed at the spaceport initially, an inspector verified their ship had nothing dangerous. She had spent most of her time blown away by the fact that Torvada used dimensional mechanics. M calculated that the civilization understood the implications of such technology and waited until he and Everin were away to try to take it for themselves. The denizens resembled worms with two legs and four arms. They had brown, segmented bodies and six eyes on their heads. They were no match physically as individuals, but they were intelligent, had numbers, and were technologically advanced. While Em hoped to avoid a fight, messing with the Torvada was strictly off-limits. He had already hooked into the civilization's digital network, and an alert showed that the government had put bounties on their heads. I saw the bounties too, said Everin. We may meet unsavory characters on our way, said Em. So be it. Em's robot body was human-sized to fit in with humans from Earth. He had portholes everywhere where a nanoswarm could emerge to create a sturdier and larger form. However, in defensive mode, he could not fly, but he still had his armor plating, density control, and strong shielding. The downside was he moved slower, and while more durable, he preferred his body's default state since it allowed him to take to the air. His orb could also go out at any time and stay linked to his body, but he used that for reconnaissance, mainly due to being smaller, nimbler, and having the ability to enter stealth. On the way, two lanky, giraffe-like aliens in a mishmash of gear opened fire below them. Everin dodged the shots, then spawned an energy shield on his left arm to reflect the beams back at them, knocking them down. M scanned the aliens as he flew past. They were still alive, and the energy beams they shot were not lethal. They were meant to disable or cause harm, but that would not be enough to slow down Everin, even if he had been hit. When they reached the spaceport, they landed, and M entered defensive mode. Nanobots swarmed out and added several layers of armor, and his density control would make it hard for anything to knock him down. His shielding output also increased. They rushed toward the Toravada. It was round, roughly fifteen feet tall and thirty feet wide, and M had heard it referred to as disc-like or resembling a hockey puck. It had pitch-black panels near the back with two horizontal slats for thrusters. The front half was solid metal although from the inside they were transparent. A light blue shield covered the side doorway, which was where they were headed. A small army of workers and security forces had surrounded the Toravada, and a machine of some type tried to break through the Toravada shielding. That would never work, but the attackers didn't know that. Everin had already been shot at by several assailants, but his ability to reflect beams caused everyone to take cover. A team of four had tried to engage in close-quarters combat, but Everin had extended his right forearm and used a repulsion beam to send the guards sprawling. M took on a barrage of shots that lit up his shielding. He retaliated, stunning those he could target, and any attackers that got close were tossed away. One assailant tried to hit M with a stun baton, but stunned himself when the hit bounced off the shields. A hovercraft with a cannon entered the area and fired. Everin leapt out of the way, but M stood strong. The blast made his shielding glow, and while he had its focus, Everin landed on the hovercraft and bent the cannon. After jumping off, they dashed into the Toravada. The interior consisted of an open area, with one hallway that led off to dimensional rooms, 
A chair resided in the middle, along with a workstation to the right and slightly ahead. The rest of the room was bare, but could spawn hard holograms as needed. Usually, when flying, the walls went transparent and the floor semi-transparent, and it was like they were floating. Everin took his seat in the command chair while M sat at the workstation. Activate scan profile 1 and stealth mode, said Everin. Acknowledged, said M. Scan profile 1 made the Torvada undetectable to almost everything. Scan profile 2 made any scan show a small, cramped ship. Stealth mode allowed the visual component of the Torvada to appear invisible. The only beings who could detect it in this mode were those the Torvada had chosen. The confused spaceport force looked around in confusion. From their perspective, the Torvada would have vanished. The Torvada hovered, then ascended. We need to downplay the advanced nature of the Torvada next inspection, said Everin. I agree, said M. However, they came in as friends. They betrayed our trust. Everin gazed out as they soared to low orbit. It happens, sadly. It also appears we have another summons. Where to? A holographic projection showed various zoomed-out windows. One showed the Milky Way galaxy, and yet another with a planet and a red dot. A location on an unknown planet in the Milky Way galaxy in AD 133 AD, said M. Everin interacted with his augmented reality interface, or ARI. It allowed a half-sphere only visible to him, starting at his waist and ending at his head, with interfaces on the inner part. M also had it but he did not need to physically interact with it. I'm unfamiliar with this planet, but we have been to that time period a few times. Well, our previous forms have, he said. M remembered two summonses he did as U4, another incarnation before V. I recall them. Are we going to investigate, or do you wish to find another space diner? I think you've had enough hot dogs. Let's check this out. Captain Herrick's trellis gazed around the command center aboard the United Planets ship, or UPS, Alpaca. Although not as ready for combat as other ships, the Alpaca could hold its own. However, its main priority was that of a transport ship. Its armament was enough to easily repel pirates, and it had the power needed to jump away in condensed space if it should encounter heavily armed ships. With a crew of 256 and a civilian group of 604 being transported, that was a lot of lives under his command. It was 4732 AD, and his current mission was to bring the refugees from a colony on the outer edge of United Planet Space to a safer place. A new alien race had decided to attack the colony, but was repelled by the arrival of the nearby United Planet's fleet, the alpaca was headed toward what the United Planets termed a checkpoint world, a place that had strong defenses and a fleet to itself. It amazed him that people wanted to live so far from a safe environment, but he also understood the desire to explore and be challenged. He ran his dark-skinned hands through his gray hair. While trips like this were monotonous, he stayed in shape with a daily exercise regime as someone who was over 200 years old, he had done many missions like this one. Little rarely happened outside the ordinary, and everything was fairly automated at this point. He glanced around at the rest of the crew in the command deck. They wore their white outfits with blue and silver outlines with pride. Over half were human, while the others were a mishmash of alien species. That spoke to the diversity of the United Planets, but also showed the impact of having Earth and Fredoria, which were almost all human, as founding members of the United Planets. Bzzzt, bzzzt. The buzzing startled him out of his thoughts. A quick check on the large screen that wrapped around the front half of the room showed an anomaly had been detected. His heart raced when he realized it was in front of them, and they were going to collide. Brace for impact, he said. The command crew attached special constraints meant to hold them in place. They were calm, despite the blaring ship-wide alert. Herrick stared at a large oval-shaped tear hanging in space. 
Its edges were alive as light blue tendrils arced out. He had only seen images of this before, but he knew this was a portal. There was no way to stop the ship from going through, and a part of it had already entered. Based on what had been researched to this time, they could be going to a new location, a new time, or a new location in time. It was extremely rare for this to occur, but this type of event had happened in the United Planets past. His stomach churned when the command area passed through. It was like a curtain of light swept by. The first sign something was wrong was the power shutting down, then emergency systems kicking in. He focused on Commander Shenna Curling. Report. She inspected her ARI. Main power, shielding, weapon systems, and our main communication network are offline. Navigation hasn't found out where we're at yet. Medical teams are dealing with the injured and wounded as they're discovered. The portal we passed through has disappeared. She flicked a finger toward the front screen that displayed a highlight of each department and what it was working on. He appreciated that his crew could respond so fast to an emergency. Wherever they were, they weren't going back through the portal. The six planets in the planetary system that had been detected around a yellow sun were promising. One planet showed as habitable, although that didn't always mean it was. How's the solar collectors? Shenna sent another set of data to the front screen. You're looking at it. Roughly 75% of them are damaged. The rest are locked in. She eyed him. You considering orbiting the sun? I was, he said. But if our solar collector situation is this bad and our shields can't get up before then, that's a death sentence. Trying to get by on only 25% of our collectors is off the table. There's no guarantee we'll even get main power back. He pointed at the habitable planet. However, we can land there and repair everything without need for life support. We'll only need the matter replicators to work, and those systems are still online. Shenna examined the planet. Atmosphere is a little rough, but there's also a satellite there. There might be a civilization. Maybe. But it's our best shot. It'll be tough to go through the atmosphere without shielding. Herrick grinned at her. The alpaca was built to handle that. Yes, but it will take damage. It'll be dangerous, said Shenna. Perhaps. But one thing to note is that we don't know whose territory we're in. A planet is a good place to hide while we repair. He motioned at her. Pick a safe landing spot, and then begin preparations. Yes, sir. Herricks needed to give a ship-wide broadcast to let everyone know of the situation. At least secondary communication was available. Although the command crew had been exemplary in responding, he was sure that was not the case everywhere else. The civilians would probably be frightened, and they had good reason to be. He had no idea where the alpaca had arrived at or when, and the ship was damaged. After a few minutes of choosing which words to say, he gave a brief speech meant to calm everyone. Shenna had nodded at him and showed him some feeds where groups of people had gathered, and they seemed to have relaxed some. He let them know about the upcoming planet landing, and they took it in stride. He went over to Shenna's workstation and examined the various locations she had selected as potential landing places. Although they would not get a full scan on the planet until they could get in orbit, the initial spots chosen were adequate. There was a higher mix of water to land than he liked, and the place she had given most of her attention was by a large inland body of water. The alpaca had a sturdier hull than most ships, and its bottom in particular was thicker than most. His main concern would be getting through the atmosphere with everything intact. For the planet landing protocol, some external components, such as antenna, communication dishes and the like, retracted to inside the ship, while every other system was locked down. There were also several designated areas that people went to that were essentially self-contained pods that could break off if needed. Some were larger than others, but everyone had a seat on one. He kept a skeleton crew out to maintain things, but hopefully there would be minimal issues. Approaching the planet, said Shenna. Herricks reached into his pocket and rubbed a small marble. It was a family heirloom and had a hole through it so it could be worn like a necklace. 
The story was that Jane Trellis, his ancestor, had been given it by Everin. Whether that was true or not, the marble had been passed down through the generations, and it was said to glow in the presence of Everin. After almost 1,600 years in his family, it still held value as a good luck charm to him. Hopefully, he wouldn't need any for this landing. Chapter 2 Herrick groaned as he used a workstation to stand. The crash had been much rougher than he had expected, and although the ship handled the atmosphere decently, the reverse thrusters did not have enough power for a soft landing. Instead, the landing had carved up the ground of a strange jungle. The ship had held together for the most part, but he saw wounded around him. The straps to hold people down worked for the most part, but some came loose, which launched crew members all over the place. He was sure that probably happened elsewhere. Another concern to contend with was the secondary communication system was down. He had tried to issue a status report request, but it had not gone through. He hobbled over to Shenna, who had unstrapped herself and stood. Are you all right? She took a deep breath. Nothing broken. But that was a rough landing. Secondary communications is down, so we won't be able to generate reports that way. I'll get an assessment for you. He laid a hand on her shoulder. Well, that's important. Take a moment. We're not going anywhere anytime soon, and if there are wounded... The medical teams will already be scouring for them. I trust the crew knows what to do. Yes, sir, she said with a forced grin before taking off with several junior officers in tow. Herricks admired her toughness. Her devotion to duty, the ship, and its crew were evident in everything she did. While she would get a deep assessment of the situation, he could at least view data the alpaca gathered on the way down— there was an alien satellite detected, but the readings on it didn't reveal much. When they had approached the spot where they would land, the environment's biological makeup had been scanned. There were only a handful of animals larger than a dog, and the ones he saw would be no match for the weapons of the security crew. As the area he was in had no window to see outside, and the interior screens that would show it were powered down, he had no idea of their immediate surroundings. The scans up to the crash, though, indicated they would be in a jungle rich with biodiversity. The atmosphere was breathable, but he also understood their mere presence could hurt the environment. The last thing he wanted to do was contaminate an area, but they would have no choice. The common cold to humans might be the next life-altering event for this planet. Herrick signaled for Bavit Corden, the security officer attached to the command area, to come over. David navigated by people getting their workstations up. Captain, I'd like to go outside and see what we're dealing with, said Herricks. Our outside sensors are shot, it seems. Very good. I've heard from a few of my guards that entry C-7 is working. Herricks extended a hand. After you. David took off. Before Herricks left the deck, he updated an officer to inform Shenno where he would be. He grimaced as he walked the hallways. Although most people seemed to be okay, there were others who were hurt badly and being helped. He acknowledged each wounded person when they tried to salute, but told them to conserve their energy. He slipped on a light armor suit after reaching the room before the entry. The outfit was sturdy and space-worthy. It could handle hazardous environments, and even with the oxygen supply on the back, it had a small converter that produced oxygen from a hostile place if any was present. He also liked that it had a wraparound screen in the helmet that allowed him to look around without obstruction. He grouped up with David and three other guards who carried energy weapons. Hopefully there would not be anything that required violence, but they were in unknown territory. Once outside, he took a moment to survey the scene. The dark orange jungle aligned with the analysis of the binary stars observed on their way in. The plant life here would have adjusted their pigment to absorb maximum light. Massive mushrooms were scattered around that rivaled the trees they stood against. It was an unusual place. One of the guards opened a container that had been wheeled out. A swarm of drones flew out. We should have a deep scan of everything around the ship in a few hours, said David. 
Herrick smiled. Excellent. Captain Herrick's main and secondary communications are back online, said Shenna over comms. Should I activate our distress beacon? Not just yet. Let's get an idea of where we are first before we notify anyone we're here, he said. Of course. I've sent a rough assessment of every area, and I was able to meet with each department head. We're running on reserve power for now, but it should last us for several months. Herrick sighed. After we've accounted for everyone. Our highest priority is ensuring our matter replicators are operational. Our level 7 replicator is damaged, so we'll need to get that operational for ship parts, said Shenna. However, the level 3 and below replicators are working, so we have food, clothing, and whatever tools are required. Herricks relaxed. While they had hard food storage for a month, most of their sustenance came from the matter replicator. It was easy to store the elements needed in a compressed tank, and they had at least six months of matter that could be used. He stared off at a mountain range in the distance. They would have to refill the element tanks, and the diversity of plant life in addition to a nearby mountain would be a good resource to dematerialize for that. We have a lot of work to do, he said. This will be a trying time for everyone. David, your security group will need to be widely available during this period. Make sure they understand what's required of them. David slapped his fist to his chest in a 45-degree angle. Yes, sir. You can count on me. I know, old friend, said Herricks, returning the salute. Shanna, make sure the engineering department gets to work on a full analysis of our status. I suspect we're going to be here for a while, and while repairing the ship is paramount, we also need to prepare for being here. Yes, sir, she said. Herrick scrutinized one of the views from the drones in his ARI. The top side of the ship had damage consistent with an entry without shielding. Anything that could not be pulled back in or remotely had been sheared off. There were also tears in the hull. Overall, the ship had done well, although internal damage reports showed there was a lot of work left. One of the drones had found the nearby body of water. The place appeared peaceful but the detection of a swarm of life signs was worrying. They resembled insects, which could pose a threat. He would feel more secure once the ship's shielding was working. Then at least they could sleep easy, knowing they had a tough defense to keep things out. For the time being, the tears in the hull would need repaired first. Another concern he was aware of was contamination. Although the ship would filter the air, there might be unknown viruses or bacteria to deal with, assuming that was how life was structured on this planet. His crew and passengers could also introduce harmful contaminants to the environment. He did not think there was any way to avoid that, as it would be all hands on deck trying to make things operational. He focused on a small, dog-like creature in the distance that stared at them. It had an oversized snout and large eyes and ears. Its scaly green skin was not too unusual, but the way it studied them made it seem like it was sizing them up. Hopefully, it didn't view them as potential meals. I saw it too, said David. Based on the scans, it has a powerful bite, but isn't physically strong. Herricks narrowed his eyes. Sounds like a predator. We'll deal with it if it hampers us, said David. All right. I'll leave you to it out here. I need to walk the ship and check in on everyone. Although he thought they would be okay in a few days, based on what the reports were showing, the repairs indicated they might be here for at least four months. The alpaca was already home to the crew, and the civilians would now need to adjust to that mentality. He was sure there would be some issues there. He rubbed his good luck charm. The situation could have been worse than it was, but he felt optimistic. M waited until they were in low orbit before opening a portal. Once it was open, the Torvada flew through. Then it jumped forward in time to April 4th, 8133 AD, 11 o'clock AM Earth time. A red dot on the planet signified where they needed to go. The Torvada pulsed a 10 light year wide scan. A satellite had been detected along with several ships and planets that had advanced technology within six light years. 
Everin rubbed his chin. Intriguing. I'm not familiar with the nearby civilization, but they possess satellite technology that matches the one over this planet. Let's do a deeper scan on the satellite. M flew the Toravada over and emitted a scanning beam. Data labels flew out on the interior wall, and a steady stream of information appeared in another window. The tech was advanced compared to Earth in 2014, but not more so than other civilizations he had interacted with. The satellite possessed a small knowledge base of basic information, helped identify what was around the planet and beyond, and showed it belonged to a race that called themselves the Gorkines, a reptilian humanoid species. My analysis indicates this is a monitoring satellite, he said. I concur. Take us down, said Everin. Acknowledged. After twenty minutes, they approached the summons location. M analyzed the long tear in the land that ended in a large crashed ship that appeared to be in the process of deconstruction. Another alien ship was parked next to it, and it had a Gorkine signature. The crashed ship registered as the UPS Alpaca. Once the Torvada was able to hover over the two ships, it performed a deep scan. M's cosmic energy fluctuated when he observed humans being used as slaves to tear down the Alpaca. The Gorkines watched over the humans, and M assessed that the bloody table with cut-up body parts suggested they were also being used for food. Everin inspected M. I'm uneasy, too. We don't know what happened here, but I suspect the alpaca crashed, and the Gorkines took advantage of the situation. My analysis would agree with that. The alpaca was reported missing on February 8, 4732 A.D., and its complement at the time was 860. There are only 236 humans below. It could be that the others were eaten, but it would be illogical to destroy their slave force that is dismantling the ship. Then let's meet them. I'll use a hologram here. This was a common technique they had used in the past. The Torvada would project a hologram of Everin, and since the Torvada was in scan profile 1 and stealth mode, there was no way to trace the hologram's origin except to a point where nothing would be detected. Everin did not even need to get out of his seat. M surmised it would be strange to others in the command area to see Everin sitting motionless while an active projection of him was outside. Another feature was that the interior walls displayed everything around Everin's hologram. This was mainly for travelers to see what was going on. M recalled one summons where a traveler had been excited by the overall experience despite the situation being bad. He scrutinized the projected environment in the command area and the several Gorkines that had rushed over to Everin. Hello, I'm Everin, a traveler who helps those in need, he said, placing an arm across his stomach and slightly bowing. I understand you somehow, said one Gorkine. I'm Reestic, leader of the Scaled Brigand. Did you understand that? I did. Reestic glanced at the other Gorkines, then back at Everin. How is it we're able to talk? You speak fluent Gaushish. I'm using advanced technology, said Everin. You're Gorkine, and you're using a human slave force to dismantle this ship. Humans. So that's what they are, said Ristic. We can't understand anything they say. These humans crashed on one of our claimed worlds. They were to be wiped out. But I see no need to let whatever technology they have go to waste. And there's no need to kill them, as they might be useful elsewhere. Everin's eyes narrowed. As slaves... Of course, said Aristic, snarling. What else would an inferior species be used for? 
M sensed Everin's cosmic energy flux. He was highly protective of humans, as was M, and the current situation would not stand with either of them. Everin looked around. I see. It appears you're also eating them. Only the ones who fail in their work, said Aristic. This ship had a crew complement of 860, yet there are only 236 humans here. Did you eat all the others? Ristic and the other Gorkines grunted and growled. No, most escaped. But we're looking for them. M detected another human male several miles away. He was using some type of binoculars while he lay flat on a large mushroom plant. M notified Everin of the man. So what do you want here? asked Ristic, moving closer to Everin. For the moment, this is merely an introduction and assessment of the current situation, said Everin. Ristic reached for him, but his hand passed through. A hologram. Just as I figured. He checked the surroundings, then his forearm device. Apparently one that is being beamed from something undetectable. You're quite advanced. Indeed, and you'll see me again. This situation has been made a priority. For what? Everin's eyes glowed. You shall see. The hologram dissipated. It seems the Gorkines have taken advantage of these humans, said Everin. He interacted with his chair console, which highlighted the man in the distance. Let's see who that is. I suspect it's one of the humans who escaped. M moved the Torvada over to the man who had begun to move away. It was easy to keep pace with him, and it was obvious he knew the environment well. Gorkin drones patrolled the area, but the man used the large mushrooms as cover. After a three-mile hike, he reached a vertical crevice in a sheer rock wall. A visual projection covered it, making it look like it wasn't there. The Torvada pulsed a deep scan that highlighted outlines inside the mountain. There were 167 life forms that registered as human. Most were not in an optimal state. A few fires had been detected, and based on the other structures analyzed, this was a camp of some type. How should we proceed? asked M. Everin stood and placed his hands behind his back. We should introduce ourselves. The humans are struggling, and I suspect they are from the alpaca. We don't know how long they've been here, but they've stayed undetected, so they possess some skill. If they're willing, we can house them here while we deal with the Gorkines. Acknowledged. M recalled a situation where they had moved a small population from one timeline to another a while back. The group was known as the Shilkrins, a rabbit-like humanoid species. Although technologically primitive, they had no issues adjusting to the comfort of the living quarters on the Torvada, which used dimensional mechanics to expand as needed. He determined the inhabitants of the cave would probably prefer that to living in caves. Everin gestured to the side of the entrance. We can land there, then introduce ourselves. We're out of the Gorkine's drone patrol range, so we should remain undetected. After landing, you can use your stealth orb mode to enter and interact. M parked the Torvada. Hopefully the humans would listen to reason and come aboard, but he understood humans had a wide variety of personalities. In addition to that, they were probably living in fear. He would do his best to show them that he and Everin were not a threat. Chapter 3 Herrick's took a moment to catch his breath. He had made it back to his camp inside a mountain, and he was not sure what he saw at the crashed alpaca. He sat with his command group of four seated around him. They probably knew he had seen something based on the way he had entered. Some of the ship's survivors had been unnerved when he hustled past them, but he needed to give an update so his crew could determine the next step of their plans. It was times like this he wished Commander Shenna had survived, but she had been eaten. Erix, what's going on? asked Commander Yulzit Horesko. Erix normalized his breathing. 
something happened at the ship. There was a hologram of someone, and whoever it was apparently pissed off the reptilians. Chief of Engineering Oming Gare shook his head. Whoever did that must have known the source would be tracked. What did the snakeheads do? Their leader swiped his hand through the hologram, but it disappeared. After that, the camp went on alert, and they launched a fleet of drones. That's when I decided to go, said Herrix. Chief Medical Officer Amanza Kazanir scanned him. Well, at least you're still in good shape. You sure you weren't followed? asked Yulzit. Herrix nodded. They all jumped when a voice said, Hello, I think we may be able to help you and those at the ship. Herrick stood and drew his energy pistol, as did the others. Who's there? he asked, looking around. I'm Everin, and there is no need for alarm. I'm outside with my friend M. We didn't want to enter your domain without authorization outside of this encounter. Herrick widened his eyes. He was not sure how Everin could have found them, but his profile, along with the Everin Protocol, was in the ship's knowledge base. The Everin Protocol dealt with how to interact with Everin, and outside the rules, it had a list of names for companions. M was on that list, as were others like V and U4. While there was no visual image of either Everin or whom he traveled with, there were descriptions. This could be a trick. However, the Gorkine drones were too large to fit through the entrance. How are you talking to us? he asked. M is in stealth mode and projecting this, said Everin. Herricks examined the room. I'd feel a lot better if we could see him. We all would, said Yulzit. Very well, said Everin. M materialized near the ceiling as a metallic orb with four segmented arms. Herrick studied him. The fact he got by the entrance sensors and was now in a private meeting area was alarming. Nonetheless, if M had wanted to be malicious, he could have. Thank you, said Herricks, motioning at the others to lower their weapons. We're aware of the Everin Protocol. What do you want? To talk about your situation with the Gorkines, said Everin. Yulzit scowled. The Gorkines... Is that what those damn reptilians are? Yes. Oming shrugged. I've never heard of them. Perhaps it's best if one of you comes out to talk with us, said Everin. What do you want to do? asked Amanza, glancing at Herrix. Herrix put away his weapon. I'll go meet with them. If something happens to me, Yulzit takes over. Let me go with you at least said Oming. Fine. Let's go. Yulzit, make sure security covers our side of the entrance. Herrick straightened up his dirty uniform. A dark thought crossed his mind that this was a trap, and these were to be his final moments. However, Everin existed in United Planets history and was seen as a protector of those who couldn't defend themselves. He motioned at M. Lead on. After passing through the entrance, Herrix sized up Everin and the humanoid robot in front of him. M flew into the robot's chest, which then sealed up. Everin had an unusual outfit, but it was one he recognized from the Everin protocol. He didn't know which version of him this was, but that was the point of the protocol. Everin slightly bowed. I'm Everin, and with me is my friend M whom you have already met. You must be Captain Herrick Trellis, and with you is Chief of Engineering Oming Gare. Herrick eyed them. That information could have been mined from our ship. Yes, it could have. Although we wish to help you with your current situation, we understand you'll need to trust us. What do you suggest we do for that? Oh, that's easy, said Herrick. He pulled out his glowing marble. His mouth went agape. Ah, a stone meant to indicate my identity, said Everin. Where did you get that? My ancestor, Jane Trellis, said you gave it to her. 
I see. I helped her long ago when she became a time refugee. Although her altered timeline was erased, she continued on in this one and joined this timeline's version of herself. I gave her this recently, from my perspective, when she was to die and I interfered. Nonetheless, there's another way we can help you identify us. You are aware of me and my companions, and also the Toravata. We can show you that. Herix had heard Everin's ship could travel through space and time. It was impenetrable, and per Jane, it had dimensional mechanics, a technology the United Planets still had not cracked. If you have it, that would suffice, he said. Everin interacted with something in front of him, but Herix could not see what it was. He widened his eyes when a small, disc-shaped ship appeared before him. It met the description of the ship in the United Planets' knowledge base. Wow, said Oming. We're going aboard, right? Everin extended a hand toward the ramp. Please proceed. Herrick licked his lips, then marched on. He surveyed the interior. There was a command chair with a workstation next to it in the center of the room. A doorway showed a wide hallway with many other doors inside it. That was dimensional mechanics, because he did not observe anything like that outside. Everin and M joined them. Do you wish for a tour? asked Everin. Ah, uh, yeah, said Herrick. He struggled to believe Everin, who was often referred to as a god by some, had come to the rescue. However, Herrick would wait to see if Everin could truly help or not. At this point, any help was better than none, and he didn't think his group would be able to hold out much longer. As they walked down the hallway, Herrick peeked into the rooms. The advanced medical lab and the research one across the hallway had caught Oming's attention. The hollow rooms intrigued Herrick, as did the conference room. However, it was the living quarters that stood out to him. Cave life was miserable compared to something like this. Everin pointed down the living quarters pathway. It can extend as required. By how much? asked Oming. As much as needed. How many survivors are at your camp? Oming frowned. 167. Herrick felt a twinge. Although he wanted to ask to move his survivors on board, it was still too early for such a big request. He didn't want to ruin a first introduction with a heavy demand, and a stern look at Oming ensured he would not say anything. Time was of the essence, but they could discuss other things. But if asked how they could help, moving everyone to the Torvado would be brought up. In the conference room, Oming went to the matter replicator. How advanced is this? It's quite advanced, said M. Does your group have a matter replicator? Oming sighed. Yeah, just one. And it's hard to keep getting matter to put into it, especially for items with rarer elements. Everin touched the replicator. It can make whatever is needed. Are you hungry? Herrick glanced at Homing. Always. Perhaps a cheeseburger and fries would suffice, said M. An earthborn dish, said Homing. He shrugged. I'm up for it. M replicated two trays with the food items, then handed them to Herrick and Homing. They all sat at the elongated rectangular table. Herrick's mouth exploded with flavors when he bit into his burger. Burgers and fries had persisted across the United Planets, although the meat varied wildly as there were thousands of variations. He munched a fry and closed his eyes. After a year of rationed replicator food that was often on the low end, this was too good to be true. Oming's expression said everything Herrick's needed to know about what he thought. It didn't take long for either of them to finish their meal. M had brought out a carbonated drink. He called it a cola and it was refreshing. That was... Amazing, said Herrick. Oh, yeah, said Oming. He frowned. Probably shouldn't tell the others we had a delicious lunch just yet. Agreed, said Herrick. I think we can give you a tour of our camp, then we can discuss next steps. Everin dipped his head forward. I assume you believe we're who we say we are. Yeah, 
I mean, if you are out to cause us harm, feeding us won't do it, said Herrix. Oming chuckled, <laughs> and giving us a tour. Perhaps one more item will assure you, said Everin. He tapped at a surface console. An image of Jane Trellis eating chocolate ice cream at the same table they were at popped up. This was when she was here, said Everin. Herrix recognized her immediately. He had studied everything about her that he could find, and the outfit she wore was one of her more common ones. She also loved chocolate ice cream, so if she was on the Torvada, there was no doubt she would have replicated it. It could be an altered display, but he didn't think Everin was trying to trick them. Herrix did notice him frown slightly. Perhaps he missed her. That's her. And, yeah, she really liked eating chocolate ice cream, he said. Oming drew his head back. I don't think I've ever heard of that. It's an earthborn treat. It's called other things now. But you would probably know it as Fredorian Donder. Oh, I know of that, but never tried it. Maybe if we can visit again, you can. Herrix ran a hand over his mouth. We've had trouble trying to figure out where we are. I hope you know where this is. Everin's eyes glowed. We do. Your ship was considered lost on February 8th, 4732 A.D. It is now April 6th, 8133 A.D., 1150 A.M., and we're on an unknown planet in the Milky Way galaxy. What? asked Herrix, oming grimaced. Well, that explains why the United Planets didn't respond to our distress beacon. The Gorkines did instead. How long have you been here? asked Everin. One year and two weeks, roughly, said Herrix. He rubbed his temples. Was it ever reported that we went back? Unfortunately not. Oh, shit, said Oming. Does that mean we're stranded here? Perhaps not, said Everin. After an assessment of your current situation and that of those at the ship, we can formulate a plan to rescue everyone and take you to the current human empire. Herrick scrunched his face. I don't mean to be rude. But why did you come a year after we crashed? Our arrival date was specified by the Torvada. It chose us to come to this specific point in space and time. Since we are here now, we are a part of events so we can't go back and interfere. Bad luck for us, said Oming. Herrick shared Oming's feeling. It was evident now they would not be going back to their time. History had already defined that, and he knew Everin would not break time travel rules for anyone based on what Herrick's had read. However, anything that got them to a place where humans were not slaves was better than the current situation. You two ready to be shown the cave? he asked. Let's go, said Everin. Herrix was certain at this point that this was Everin. That meant Herrix would need to be careful what was said about any event that involved him. The protocol was meant to preserve timeline integrity, since if Everin understood how an event played out, it would alter his decision-making. It was one of the oldest United Planets protocols, but Herrix had a special interest in it. That knowledge would pay off. M had observed Herrix and Oming when they were on the Torvada. Their expressions yielded a ton of information based on M's organic interaction library. He had cataloged many interactions with organics in his previous incarnations, and the expression he would ascribe to Herrix and Oming was impressed. When they had burgers, they were satisfied, but they became serious when leaving. They were now back inside the cave. It had a large open area, and M had detected various groups huddled around fires. A quick scan showed there to be suction systems that pulled the smoke in, and some people would take its contents to another hallway. It was most likely used for input to a matter replicator. The survivors often frowned, and there was no laughter. M's orb pulsed, triggering a priority to help them. Although he had already set that goal... The orb added a physical response to the sensation. He knelt when a little boy ran up. A robot, said the kid. I hope I didn't scare you, said M. The boy shook his head. M smiled. 
A woman hurried over, shot an apologetic look at Herricks and the others, then grabbed the boy. I'm sorry. My son. He gets excited easily. It's quite okay, said M. We're here to help. The woman's eyes misted. And he is appreciated. M raised his hand, palm forward toward the boy. I believe a high five is in order. The boy gleefully smacked it. Em waved at the woman and her son, then joined the others when they continued on. It was a small interaction, but it showed that hope had not been lost here. He had seen Everin do it before, and it had endeared him to those who observed the interaction. Other survivors had taken notice, and they stared as the group passed. Herricks waved around. As you might guess, this is our communal area. Most of the living quarters, if you can call it that, are a bit farther away, as are our makeshift medical spot and a special room for the replicator. How do you process waste? asked Everin. Herricks grimaced. Probably not in the most hygienic way, but we use buckets, then feed it to the matter replicator. All waste goes there, actually. That's an efficient approach if you only have one replicator, said Everin. Yeah, but when it's what makes what you eat or drink, the room creates a smell you don't usually want to associate with food. It's one reason everyone rarely eats anything that's highly seasoned or spicy. How's your water situation? asked Everin. I'll show you. Come on, said Herricks. After five minutes, they reached a side storage room that had several large containers with spigots. Water is easy to make with the replicator, so we dedicate the mornings to filling these containers. Everyone has their personal one that they fill from this, said Herricks. Everin inspected the area. Given the container's capacity, I assume washing up is not done often. Herricks coughed. Just enough for a wipe down, essentially. But we use a solvent afterward that helps keep dirt off. I do miss a good sonic shower. I see. They continued on to the replicator room. The replicator was small, and there were three people around it, making items. A doorway off to the right had a strong fecal odor, and M suspected the replicator's input unit was in there. How do you keep the replicator powered? asked Everin. We brought three fusion cells from the ship. Each one can last about two years with full power so I'm hoping we don't need to be here that long. Everin used his ring to scan the area. I see it. Did you plan out this area while you were on the ship? Herricks lowered his head. Yeah, but it was to be a backup site. I had this area scouted and packed with supplies, and it was meant to be temporary. Then the Gorkines came. Three groups split up. One was captured, the other reached here, and I'm not sure what happened to the other group. He looked up with hopeful eyes. I'm hoping your and M's presence here will help change things. I think it might be best if we discussed a plan on the Toravada, said Everin. In addition to that, we should move everyone there unless there is a reason to remain here. Herricks perked up. No reason I can think of, Oming. None. But we should bring in Yulzit and Amanza to discuss things, he said. You're right. And they're waiting for us as it is. Herricks faced Everin. While I don't think there will be an issue, it still needs decided on by the group. I understand, said Everin. If there is anything we can do to help, let us know. We'll be on the Torvada. Got it, said Herricks. He and Oming took off. I think they'll agree, said M. I believe so, but I also understand the importance of command structure. It may be what's kept this group alive for so long. Let's go, said Everin. M wanted to begin the evacuation process immediately, but he would wait. Now that the Gorkines were aware of Everin's presence, they might step up search patrols. He waved at several survivors on the way back. There was curiosity in their eyes, but they registered as miserable. 
After getting back to the Torvada, M analyzed his readings from the cave. It was livable, but humans tended to not like being cooped up. All it would take was a child or someone out getting fresh air to be detected by the Gorkines, and it would then be over. The humans weren't in fighting shape. He was not sure what plan would be crafted, but with Herrick's group on the Torvada, they could then figure out how to rescue the other humans. There was potentially another group out there and assuming Herrick's group boarded, the Torvada could jump back in time to witness things as they occurred. It would help fill in some details after the crash landing. For now, it was a waiting game while Herrick's talked to his command group. M planned to expand the living quarters to support 860 individuals. Although he knew some survivors had been eaten and others most likely perished in the last year, there could have been babies born. His orb pulsed at the thought of what the humans had been through, and he would ensure they were taken care of. Chapter 4 M flew in orb mode while stealthed over the crashed ship site. It had been a few hours since Herrick's had decided to talk with his command group. M had already expanded the living quarters to support all the survivors. Hopefully, Herrick's group would decide to leave the cave, it was a logical choice, but M also understood humans could go in different directions based on their emotions. He hovered over the ongoing dismemberment of an older male. The Gorkines were not subtle with their hacking, and they did it while the man was alive. However, he stopped moving after his head was cut off. The butcher then sliced open the various body parts and pulled out specific pieces. Other Gorkines skinned the hacked segments. It was an efficient process, and the Gorkines relished all the blood spattering everywhere. M flew over to the makeshift camp that served as a housing area. The tents were crude, and each one had various containers. It would be 3 o'clock p.m. Earth time, and the place only had a few humans napping. He went to where the ship was being torn apart, and also where the majority of the humans were. His orb pulsed at seeing how tired and defeated they were. Some used specialized hand cutters that sliced into the ship with ease to carve out chunks that could be moved to another area. Others did the moving, while yet another group cleared out future areas to be disassembled. Several drones hovered in place with weapons systems armed. M had calculated the humans might have been able to destroy the drones with the cutters, but the humans would then be killed by the nearby Gorkine guards. Perhaps that had already happened, and what remained were the survivors. M went to the Gorkine ship, where Ristic sat outside with other Gorkines. They snacked on fried human parts while sipping a blue liquid. There were a few humans around, and they had collars on their necks. Their purpose was unknown, but M surmised they could have been used for sexual gratification, Although the scans from the Gorkines showed they did not have compatible genitalia, they did have an area that, when rubbed, most likely caused great satisfaction. M. Herrix and his command group are outside the Torvada. They're ready to talk, said Everin over comms. I'm on my way, said M. After arriving, he joined Herrix, Oming, Amanza, and Yulzit, who talked with Everin outside the Torvada. Although M had not officially met Amanza and Yulzit, he had detailed records of both. M went inside and docked to his body, then joined the others. Hey, M, said Herrix. Hey, yourself, said M with a smile. Herrix laughed. All right. Well, can we talk in the conference room? We can, said Everin. Are you sure this isn't a ruse to eat more cheeseburgers? Oming grinned. No, but it doesn't hurt. Wait. You said cheeseburgers? Asked Yulzit. Someone's been holding out on us, said Amanza. I was teasing, said Everin. Please follow me. M analyzed the group after they entered the Toravada. Their accelerated heartbeats indicated they were excited, despite outwardly appearing calm. While the interior of the command area was blank except for Everin's chair and M's workstation, the hallway that led to other dimensional rooms had them riveted. 
Yulzit and Amansa ran outside, then back in. Dimensional mechanics, just like you said, said Yulzit, gesturing at Herrix. Yeah, and that hallway is just the jumping off point. Everin waved forward. Indeed. Let's go to the conference room. M followed them into the hallway. Yulzid and Amanza paused at each doorway to look in. Their surprised faces probably indicated they were trying to match up what they knew versus what they were seeing. He had seen that before, although the Torvada's interior was different back then, but the expressions were similar among humans and most aliens. When they got to the conference room, everyone took their seats, but not before Yulzid and Amanza had gotten plates with cheeseburgers and fries. Their rapid eating and heavy breathing afterwards suggested they liked what they ate. They also guzzled their colas with abandon. I'm glad to see you enjoyed your meals, said Everin. Yulzit burped. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, that was great. No concerns here, said Amanza, easing back into her chair with her hands clasped over her stomach. Hope this doesn't come back to bite me. You should be fine. Everin gestured at Herrick's. Have you all reached a decision on transporting the rest of your group here? We're unanimous in moving, said Herrick's. However, it may take a bit to get everyone situated. Some can't move due to poor health. Also, many have sentimental items, and that might require a few trips. There are also some ship items we had stashed we'd like to bring. We can work with whatever schedule you want to set up, said Everin. Yulzit's eyes narrowed. Well, I think this is good for us. What about those at the alpaca? Those damn Gorkines are using the crew as slaves there. We have a plan based on M's scouting from earlier, said Everin. And that is? asked Yulzit. Everin tapped at the table console, causing an overhead projection to show off the crashed ship site. The ship was lined up on the right side, with the Gorkine one on the upper left. The top part had an area where humans were butchered, and the very bottom of the map showed the processing site where the alpacas dismantled parts went. An open spot sat in the middle of everything. He pointed at the Gorkine ship. M will disable this first. Although he can do so silently, it'll most likely attract some attention. After doing so, the Torvada will disable the drones guarding those working on the alpaca, then land in front of it near the middle of the open area. I will then deal with the rest of the Gorkines, and Herricks and others can guide the workers both inside and outside the alpaca to the Torvata. Amanza wrinkled her brow. That's all a bit risky, don't you think? Yes, there is some risk here. What are your concerns? asked Everin. For starters, what if they go into some form of lockdown once they notice their ship is unresponsive? Also, you're going to take on a whole squad of Gorkines solo? Sure, some will be on the ship, but what about the others on the perimeter or coming back from patrols? And what about the rest of our crew inside the alpaca? How do we deal with those guards? On top of all that, they'll definitely detect the Torvada landing. Yulzit raised his eyebrows. Good points. Everin highlighted the Gorkine's ship. Their ship is relatively primitive from a system's perspective. M won't have any issues disabling it once connected. Its shutdown will be noticeable. But they shouldn't think the workers are involved. The Torvada can handle the drones since they have weak shielding, and the Torvada stun beams will break through that. Also, I understand you don't have a frame of reference, but those guards will be no match for me. Neither of you has lied to us yet, so we'll have to trust you, said Amanza. Herrick motioned at Everin. They aren't up to date on the lore surrounding you, Yulzit snorted. The Everin Protocol is one of many that we had to learn about, but its invocation is so rare it's not something you remember. I understand, said Everin. Why not let the Torvata take down all the guards? asked Oming. If it can handle the drones, the guards should be no problem. Everin outlined various places on the map. The Gorkines will go to cover. From there, they can potentially harm the crew. 
I need them to focus on me. Also, the Torvado will need to be on the ground for survivors to board. Oming bobbed his head. Got it. It seems you've covered every angle. Yulzit's face turned serious. On another note, we're far in the future now, and Herrick's said we can't go back to our time. What's to happen with us after all this? I'll take everyone to the nearby human civilization, said Everin. They're far more advanced than the United Planets, and I'll serve as an ambassador on your behalf since they know me already. Amonzo wagged a finger. What if we went back in time but changed our names or something? If that happened, there would most likely have been some records on it, but history does not show that, and we have an extensive amount of information from that time period. She sighed. So our disappearance is a fixed point. In this stable timeline, yes. While I could take you back, it would cause a timeline change. That is when civilizations can be wiped out and those who are temporally shielded hunt you. Amanza's eyes widened. Oh, sounds specific. So, you've seen humanity's past? What about our future as a species? asked Oming. Everin's eyes softened. Your future is beautiful and very important to me. Then I think we have a plan, said Herrix. Indeed. Perhaps you would all like a tour of the Torvata before we begin boarding people, said M. Yulzit perked up. Yeah, let's do that. Amanza stood. No argument here. M liked that Herrick's group had made the decision to trust him and Everin. They were rational and possessed good judgment, qualities that would have been a requirement for a United Planets officer. However, he also understood that humans under stress often made emotional responses. Herricks had enjoyed the hour-long tour of the Torvada with the rest of his command group. He had to pull Amanza away from the medical lab, lest she spend all her time there. The research lab was a big hit, and for a brief moment, Herricks wondered what it would be like to travel with Everin and M. However, he was thrilled to begin evacuating the cave. The first people to board were ecstatic to have rooms with sonic showers and replicators that could make better food. It was also no surprise that many had replicated new clothing while some took the opportunity to nap. The process would take some time. While families boarded, other survivors focused on dismantling existing equipment and preparing those who could not move on their own. Herrix relaxed as more boarded. From what he had read, the Torvada was impenetrable by normal matter. He had peeked into the living quarter's main area and liked that several playgrounds had been erected in the central pathway. There were even trees spread throughout, benches lined the sides, and people moved along the two levels of walkways on the sides. Yulzit and Amanza directed people on where to go, while some of the young adults helped lead others to their rooms. He had thought there might be a mad rush to board but everyone took their time. It could be they were suspicious and held back, or maybe they had been accustomed to the cave and preferred not to go. Although he didn't expect any holdouts, there could be some. They might prefer to live on this world versus going to an advanced civilization. Herricks visited Oming and M, who had brought some hover slabs from the Torvata to assist those who could not move. There were twenty-seven in that state, and the layered slabs held two at a time. After Oming and M had left for their return trip with four individuals, Herrick talked with one of the elderly men who struggled to believe they would be rescued. The man was a civilian and had been on his way to a family gathering. Sadly, he would never see them again. An explosion echoed throughout the cavern. Herrick's heartbeat spiked. It sounded like someone had set off a bomb. He rushed out to try to find the source. Everin and M had dashed inside the cave, and Herrix joined them. What was that? asked Herrix. Per the Torvata scan, several endpoints in this cave have busted open, said Everin. Unknown life forms have been detected. Herrix gulped. It's probably that bug species that used to use this cave. We sealed those entrances, though. Maybe all this activity riled them up. If you wish, 
we can hook you into the Torvada systems. You can then see what we do and communicate across distances, said Everin. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like that, said Herrix. He widened his eyes after Everin flicked his finger toward him. Herrix's ARI displayed a map of the caves with different colored regions. The green indicated people either prepping to go to the Torvada or already on the way to it. The three red areas showed where the cave breaches had occurred. White dots indicated the survivors, and there were some in the red areas. The unknown life forms registered as blue. We need to help them, he said. Indeed, said Everin. Two areas need an immediate response. The third has no one but it would be wise to secure that entrance. I'll handle that if you two can deal with the creatures, said Herrix. We can do that. Let's go, said Everin with M in tow. Herrix contacted his command group and had them organize a small security squad to meet him at the entrance to the third red area. Although they only had energy pistols, that should be enough to hold the area. Everin and M had already split off into their respective red areas and were actively engaging. Herrix stood at the entrance with a pistol out. The first creature to appear made his skin crawl. His security force had killed a smaller version before sealing the area long ago. That must have been a junior version, because this one was large and had a segmented body with thicker armor plating of some type. Each segment had two pincher-like legs on the side. Its head was mostly mouth, with a series of black eyes lining the top, and its movement speed unnerved him. He fired a stun shot, but missed. The creature got closer. His pulse quickened as he took aim, then hit the creature in the face. It shrieked and fell to the ground. Yulzit and Amanza arrived with four others and adopted a defensive posture. That is one ugly monster, said Yulzit. Yeah, and there's four more coming, said Herrix. Amanza glanced at him. How do you know? Herrix tapped his temple. Everin and Emma hooked me into the Torvada's systems. They're handling the other two breaches. If you all can hold this area and keep anything from passing, I can assist in the evacuation of others in hostile areas. Go, said Yulzit. He shared a look with Herrix. We got this. Herrix nodded, then rushed to where M was. There were eight survivors there initially, but only five registered now. They were sealed in a room with the creatures outside, and M was headed that way. When Herrix arrived, M was fighting six creatures by himself. Three dead survivors with missing limbs were on the floor. Herrix figured M was strong, but he had not expected M's shielding to hold against so many bites. The dead civilians had probably been caught unaware and they definitely did not survive the initial attack. M tossed the creatures away, then would point at and stun them only to have another one arrive. Herrix opened fire, stunning a few of the monsters. M took the opportunity to stack the downed beasts at the entrance. He then shot a milky white substance that held the attackers together and created a blockade. Herrix reached the survivor's door and pounded on it. It's clear. Let's go. They wasted no time in hustling out. They breathed heavily and had wide eyes when they rushed by the downed assailants. I think we're clear here, said Herrix. Acknowledged. We need to retreat to the hallway to this area and I'll seal it, said M. How? He waved forward. My nanobots. What about the dead bodies? I can remove them before I seal the hallway. Herrix puffed his cheeks before following M to the end of the hallway. M aimed forward, and a swarm of nanobots flew out. They went in and grabbed what parts they could of the dead bodies, then pulled them out and placed them in a pile. He then began to fill the hallway with the surrounding material. Nanobot swarms were not new to Herrix, but he understood how much power and maintenance they needed. Herrick's imagined the three people who died probably had hoped they were leaving. Then they got slaughtered. His stomach churned. It would have been even worse without Emma around. After the tunnel was sealed, they rushed to where Everin was. Herrick's was impressed by how fast Everin moved. He had sealed several entrances and fought eight creatures trying to swarm him. 
He fired stun beams from his forearm devices while his shield blocked bites and his baton knocked the monsters away with ease. Thankfully, the people who had been trapped had fled with no casualties, but there was no doubt that if Everin had not stepped in, there would be chaos in the main cavern. M joined the fray and stunned several attackers. Herrix did the same. Once Everin was free from fighting, he pushed the monsters back and closed the breaches they came from. These sealed hallways won't last long. We need to get everyone on the Torvada now. I've relayed the situation to the others, said Herrix. They've held the third entrance, and almost everyone is on the Torvata. There's still a few who are sick who haven't been moved, but there's a team going to them now. Very good, said Everin. We should seal the hallway to this area as a precaution. Yeah, and while I think we could have won without your assistance, there would have been many more casualties. I'm glad we could help, said Everin. Let's get the remaining survivors on board and anything else your group needs. Herrick's followed them to the end of the hallway that led to this section of the caves. They closed it in record time with both of their nanobot swarms. Everin and Am reminded him of Paragons, the elite United Planets Marshals. Nanobot swarms were one of their components, and they had been known to use them to seal or open areas. After the hallway was closed, they went to the replicator area to retrieve the replicator. Herrix had wondered why they didn't just leave it, but based on what he saw Everin and M targeting for pickup, they sought to remove anything with technology. It was evident they didn't want to leave behind any type of footprint. Herrix was just glad to catch his breath. He was not out of shape, but he had exerted himself and was still pumped on adrenaline. Yulzit had pointed out some blood on Herrick's suit. It dawned on him that he had rushed headlong into battle without hesitation. That indicated how much trust he had in Everin and M. He was not sure the others would have done the same. Regardless, the evacuation was almost completed, and they needed to collect the corpses and body parts for a proper burial later. Once on board, he could calm everyone without being attacked. Chapter 5 M verified everyone had boarded the Torvado. All traces of technology had been cleared, and Herrick's and his command group were in the living area's central corridor, providing assistance. M's orb pulsed as he reviewed the earlier scene when he had arrived to aid the trapped survivors. One was crying out on the ground as his limbs were being severed. The other tried to help, but he was cut in half. The last person was already dead. M wondered if he had been too slow to arrive, but he verified he had moved at optimal speed. While the creatures posed no threat to him, they were fast, nimble, and deadly. Thankfully, Herrix had arrived and assisted the others while V held the monster's attention. The Torvada had unleashed a swarm of nanobots inside the cavern. Everything would be meshed together to make it appear as if no one had been there. The three dead bodies, or what was left of them, had been moved into specially lined caskets. Per United Planets protocol, the corpses would be given a burial and rites. M calculated that Herrix was torn between being relieved at the evacuation to being nervous based on his sporadic breathing, the licking of his lips, and the flexing of his hands. It would be a lot for a leader to take in, but he had performed admirably and worked with what he had. In the living quarters dimensional area, Herricks and the others were not only directing their group to their rooms, but also triaging who needed care. The medical room had been expanded, and Amanza had set up there. She had replicated United Planets equipment to treat everyone. Although there were more advanced tools, M calculated that trying to learn it all would potentially distract her. The Torvada had ascended high into the sky, and with Scan Profile 1 active along with Stealth Mode, they would be undetected. M hung out in the main central area of the living quarters. Children laughed as they explored the various playgrounds while teenage survivors assembled around benches. The second level had some adults leaning on it and looking over everything. He also enjoyed watching others. After 30 minutes, he assembled in the conference room with Herrick's command group. 
Before we begin, I wanted to say that this is more than we could have imagined, said Herrix. He gulped. You're truly the Everin of legend. I'm glad you and everyone else are in a better position now, said Everin. Amanza smiled. Everyone will be healed up in no time. The medical equipment was exact replicas and brand new. She eyed him. I saw some other tools in the hollow menu, but they seemed pretty advanced. They're from many other places, and some require additional knowledge to use. Yulzit wrinkled his brow. Will we be able to see United Planets history up to this point? Everin interacted with the table console, causing several holographic windows to appear. It appears the Torvato will allow it. You don't control that? asked Oming. Everin shook his head. The Torvata filters what can be seen and by whom. How? The Torvata can see everything in this plane. It knows the past, present, and future, although it sees multiple possibilities. The Torvata must not see your knowledge of the past as an issue. That means you were always meant to come here. Herrick's grimaced. I had family back there. I am sure many others did too. Hopefully, learning about our pasts won't cause an issue, but I suspect there might be a rough period as everyone adjusts. Amanza frowned. I wish I could see my sister. I understand, said Everin. I don't want to appear cold in not allowing travel to the past. However, a timeline change can be disastrous. If it was one or two people, perhaps it would be possible. But a crew of this size is too much. I get it. I just don't like it. But I do appreciate our new situation. Herrick's eyes narrowed. Speaking of which, this human civilization will be going to. How different are they from the United Planets? Everin pulled up a holographic map of the Milky Way galaxy, then highlighted a blue-colored region. This is the Convax Federation. They're a large coalition of civilizations, one of which is the human-centric Benetton Collective. They're far more advanced than the United Planets and cover more territory. And you said you've met them before, asked Herrick's. I have. They're different, but still human. They're also less emotional than what you might expect. Oming sat up, like machines. In some capacity, yes, Every human has a significant amount of nanobots in their system. They're logical, highly educated from birth, and often sought after as mediators. That doesn't sound too bad, said Yulzit. Everin raised a finger. Perhaps not. You'll note a distinct lack of the arts in general, and their food will seem bland to you. However, your group's presence will be a good contrast to their society. Hmm. And they're going to be okay with us being time travelers. Not by choice, obviously. I think they will, said Everin. They're aware of time travel and those who use it, such as M and I. Yulzit gazed at the others. This is going to be interesting. Speaking of time travel, can we see the event where we went through the portal? Of course. To the command center, then. Perhaps the roof would provide a better view, said M. Everin paused. Good idea. Let's go. Although Herrick had already time-traveled, it had been against his and his crew's will. Now he would get to do it in an observer role. He had a burning desire to see what happened before and after they went through and then their eventual descent. He wondered if the Gorkines had detected them initially. The roof had some chairs placed along the light blue guardrail that encircled the area, but he was too anxious to sit. A quick check on Oming, Yulzit, and Amanza showed they had the same idea. A podium had materialized with an angled top that M interacted with while Everin stood by with his hands behind his back. The Torvata ascended until it was in low orbit. Prepare yourselves, said Everin. 
Herrick's heart pumped furiously when the Torvada fired a gold beam that created a silver-bordered portal with a light blue rippling surface, then flew through. He had tried to get a glimpse of the portal's sides when going through, but there was nothing he could discern. He had blinked and was already on the other side in deep space. We're now in the location where your ship went through the portal. Now we travel back in time, said Everin. Herrick shared a look with the rest of his command crew. He grabbed the guardrail when everything outside faded away, then eased back in. It made his skin crawl. However, it was the UPS alpaca being highlighted on the interior shielding that made him focus. The Torvata shielding extended out in a bubble, but the crisp display stood in stark contrast to the darkness of space. We've arrived slightly before the recorded incident, said M. Everin pointed at a blue dot in the alpaca's flight path. That is where your logs indicated the event occurred. The Torvada moved toward the dot. This is amazing, said Amanza. She eyed Everin. So, we're here and there at the same time. Yes, said Everin. There is no chance of interaction between these two points in your time stream, thanks to the undetectable nature of the Toravada. Yulzit rubbed his chin. It hurts my head to think of it. We're right there. We could stop this and avoid the nightmare on that planet we crashed on. Herrick shot him a glance. I'm just saying. I know we won't do that, but I can't help thinking it. Herrick's has a personal understanding of timeline changes said Everin. His eyes softened. His ancestor, Jane Trellis, came from a timeline created by a change. When my friends and I corrected the timeline, she was stranded in this one. Since it was one person, she was allowed to stay. He eyed Herricks. And his existence is proof of what a minor change can do. The command crew stared at him. Herricks grinned. Well... I'm glad to exist. I'm glad you do too, and I get it, said Yulzit. The Torvada hovered outside a highlighted spot. Where's the portal? asked Amanza. I assume it will show itself here in a moment, said Everin. Herrick joined everyone in gazing quietly at a small patch of space. Nothing had shown yet, but the alpaca flew toward the area. He understood Yulzit's perspective. Things would be much easier if they could warn their earlier selves. But that didn't happen. After several minutes, his mouth went dry. A massive, irregular patch of space was outlined. It was large enough to accommodate the alpaca and then some. It made sense now why the portal had not been detected until it was too late. It had spawned from nowhere just a few moments before the alpaca's arrival. He winced when the alpaca charged through and disappeared. So that was it. Oming frowned. Unfortunately. M. Take us to a few minutes before the scans of the first United Planets recovery ship to this region during the search for the alpaca, said Everin. Acknowledged. Herrick gazed at a star in the distance that faded from view along with everything else, then eased back in. Time travel was trivial for the Toravada, and he imagined Jane soaking all this up. Like her, he was now a temporary time traveler. A ship five light years away approached the area. The portal's still here, said Yulzit. Was that in the ship's scan report? It wasn't, said Everin. M, expand shields and seal this portal. Acknowledged. You can do that, asked Amanza. Everin nodded. Herrick wrinkled his brow. The portal had sealed up after we went through, though. The visible aspect may have, but it was still there, said Everin. Herrick peered out of the Torvado when it flew through. He widened his eyes as the highlighted edge of the portal faded. There was no indication of the shielding being expanded, but its impact was obvious. He peeked back but there was only the emptiness of space, similar to what he had seen when they had gone through. You had to close it in order for history to record nothing was detected, said Herricks. Indeed, said Everin. 
A timeline change would have happened if you hadn't, right? Asked Oming. Yes. It might have attracted others who could have flown through, but there were no other reported disappearances in this area. He glanced at them. Take us to a few minutes after the alpaca's arrival to the planet. Acknowledged. The Torvada jumped forward in time, then opened a portal and flew through, exiting into low orbit. Oming gestured at a satellite. That must be the Gorkins. We detected that on the way in. Everin zoomed in the view. It's one of their monitoring satellites. Although they have claimed this planet, they have not done anything with it yet. The satellite was to ensure no one trespassed. Herrick scowled when the satellite activated upon the alpaca's arrival. A steady stream of signals was sent in a specific direction. That must have been why the Gorkins arrived only a few days later. He grimaced as the Torvada followed the alpaca down until it crashed. Yulzit crossed his arms. To think that while we went through hell, our future selves were right above us the whole time. I understand, said Everin. M, take us to when the Gorkins arrived. The Torvada ascended to orbit, then jumped forward a few days. Eryx's pulse quickened at the outline of the familiar ship that had changed their lives. It cruised past the satellite and descended toward the crashed alpaca. The Torvada followed but kept its distance. He gulped hard as the Gorkin ship arrived at the alpaca. He remembered that moment well. At first he thought they had been rescued. That was dispelled quickly, and observing the Gorkin ship firing on the alpaca enraged him. Those assholes, said Gulzit balling his hands into fists. We didn't stand a chance. The Gorkins landed and filed out, weapons firing everywhere. Drones swarmed out and attacked everyone outside the alpaca. Herrick's eyes misted as Bavid was hit by an energy beam. It created a crescent-shaped wound in his side, killing him instantly. Herrick's remembered that well since he had rushed out at the time. Damn. Bavid, said Oming, Herrick cleared his throat while gritting his teeth. He wanted nothing more than to jump down and kill every Gorkin in sight. However, he knew he could not interfere. He didn't know how Everin and M handled this. Look, there we are, said Yulzit, pointing off to the side. A large group of survivors fled into the nearby forest. They would eventually find the cave, but not before a small contingent gave their lives to provide misdirection. Another group headed in the other direction, while the Gorkins focused on the remaining survivors at the ship, who would become food, slaves, and entertainment. Can we track where the other group went? asked Yulzit. We can, said Everin. Herrick shook his head. Let's get some rest first, then focus on rescuing the survivors we know of at the ship. Then we'll have all the time we need to look for the others. Fair enough, said Yulzit. We can do that now that we have Everin, M, and the Torvata on our side. I like the plan to rescue those at the ship, said Amanza. However, we'll need to designate a group to retrieve them while Everin and M have the Gorkins busy. I'll handle it, said Herrix. There doesn't need to be many of us, just enough to point them in which direction to run. He looked at Everin. Can we replicate United Planets equipment? Yes, but I'd suggest using items from your time period to avoid a learning curve, said Everin. Also, please use stun. I understand some will want to kill the Gorkins, but they must face justice by the galactic powers here. Yulzit grumbled. They deserve to die. I understand your perspective. Truly, I do, said Everin. Herrix gave Yulzit a stern look. We'll abide by it. I'll handle setting that group up and getting them equipment for tomorrow. The rest of you, take what remains of the night off and relax. This may be the first night that we really can since the crash. Fine, said Yulzit. Yulzit, Amanza, and Oming tapped Herrick's arms before they exited the roof. You're a natural leader, said Everin. Herrick shrugged. I just wanted a captain a ship. I know of the perils. But how do you train for something like this? It would be difficult to do so. Despite the situation, you got some of your crew away safely. 
Herrick hung his head. Yeah. But for how long? They'd find us eventually, and that cave was dangerous to begin with. We set that site up almost immediately as a precaution, but I didn't know it would become our refuge. I should have taken more there. His eyes misted as he looked at Everin and Em. I don't know why the Torvada chose for you to help us, but I will always be eternally grateful. Everin's eyes glowed. There'll be better days ahead. We resolve the now so we can focus on the future. Herrick gulped. He loved that he got to interact with those he had only read about, and even then it was more like reading about myths. Everin and M were anything but that. Herrick wanted to ask about the other forms described in the Everin Protocol, but understood that would be a violation. He was not going to worry about which form came to rescue the crew, and he was thankful that one did. Chapter 6 It was 8 o'clock a.m. the next day, and M had observed those who had stayed up late the previous night when they visited the hollow room, medical labs, and central area in the living quarters. The general mood had improved, and he had witnessed several ticking hits off an electronic tobacco device. These were activities he was familiar with in regard to those from the United Planets in their time period. He had also allotted resources to the upcoming fight. The Torvada hung silently over the alpaca, and he and Everin were on the roof, studying the camp and its movement. M had initially detected four drones— but there were six now. The Torvada should still be able to handle them without issue. Everin had marked out the Gorkines' guard patrols. There had also been dog-like drones that had not been registered before. They moved silently next to their handlers and were used for intimidation, as illustrated by the humans who bent away and flinched when the drones came near. M and Everin could take the camp with ease if there were no innocents. Herrix had been busy getting together a retrieval group, but they would be putting themselves at risk, especially once they entered the alpaca. One advantage they had was they knew the ship's interior. While the humans outside would be rescued quickly, that would not be the case for those inside. M had wanted to enter and scan the alpaca interior, but there was detection shielding at the entrance. The Torvada had a rough scan, and that would have to do— the Gorkines were already on higher alert than when he had first met them, and any notification of his presence would exacerbate that. He would also be tied into the Torvada and would project holograms for misdirection after disabling the ship. There were several programs he could run, from one that would make other Gorkines appear as human to another that would create assault groups around the perimeter. It would only last for a short while until the Gorkines caught on. The human slaves at the camp had already started their daily routine. Herrick's group is getting ready, said M. Good, said Everin. Their replicated equipment is of higher quality than that of their time period. Their shields will block the Gorkine's blasts. M studied him. You're worried for them. I am. That should be of no surprise to you. It isn't. But I share your concern. Even with the new gear, they'll still be vulnerable to other tactics. Also, the humans we're rescuing have no defenses or weapons. A stray shot could harm them. Everin raised a finger. And that's why we need to ensure our plan works. I will keep the Gorkines focused on me. How do you intend to approach the fight? By taking Ristic out first, said Everin. Then I'll disable those in front of the ship. That should clear the area for Herrick's crew to rescue those outside before boarding the alpaca. I'll deal with the perimeter security and guard patrols coming in. Do you see any obstacles in disabling the ship? M examined it. There's potentially a few. I'll enter when one of the Gorkines does. Then I'll need to find an interface point. From there, I plan to disable the ship. I also plan to render any guards there unconscious. We're ready to go, said Herrick's over comms. Acknowledged. I'm going to the Gorkines' ship now, said M. 
He popped his orb out of his robot body. Stealth mode engaged. The robot mode would have provided more defense, but it would be easily spotted and was not well suited for infiltration. He flew out of the Torvada and hovered near a side door on the Gorkin's ship. When the door opened for a guard after a bioscan, M adjusted his temperature and trailed him to a T-junction. The scanners had beeped, causing the guard to look around, but after not finding anything, he shrugged and went right. M scanned the immediate area and detected cameras embedded at the top of each doorway. They had thermal tracking, but his temperature change would prevent him from being tracked. He followed the guard, who entered a unit in a living area. M did not follow him inside, but the living area presented an opportunity. He found an open room and entered. A quick scan revealed there was an interface he could connect with, and it would provide him a safe space to work from. After sealing the door, he hovered next to an interface on the wall. There were several ports next to an embedded console, so he extended one of his segmented arms and formed the appropriate plug. Once jacked in, he examined the ship's digital environment. An AI had been detected, but it was highly specialized in flight systems. It intrigued them that the weapons, engine, and life support systems were decentralized, the Gorkins most likely didn't trust an AI to handle all of it, or they wanted to limit being hacked. He would need to go to each area to disable the appropriate system. The only thing he could disable from where he was now was the life support system. The ship's layout and crew locations were available, so M knew where everyone was. He adjusted the life support to restrict the amount of oxygen the Gorkins required. It would make them sluggish while he did other things. The next system to go down would be the communication one. After that, the engines needed to be shut down, then the weapons systems. He exited the room and flew toward the communication center. On most ships, that was usually integrated into the command center, but the Gorkins had it separated out. It was by itself and had external windows with force fields, an unusual design for an advanced ship. It should be inside the center of the ship where it would be most protected. The communication center had three Gorkins, two tapped away at a holographic interface on their workstations, while a third stood with his hands behind his back, facing a wall with a large screen. He positioned himself above them, then extended a segmented arm at each and fired a stun blast. The Gorkins crumpled. M flew down fast, then connected to the workstation. He sealed the doors to the room, then analyzed the communication system. There were two substations outside the ship that would be an issue. That meant if the ship's communication systems were down, the substations could still be used. He was not sure if this was a standard Gorkin tactic, but they might be able to get a signal out. The Torvada could disable the stations, but it would need to fly out to each one. He disabled the long-range communication connection and the link to the substations. This would allow the Gorkins to use comms locally, but not send a distress call. He also deactivated the surveillance systems. The next stop was the engine room. It was a smart approach for the Gorkins to not allow a central system to take down the engine. The downside was that if anyone breached the engine room, they could shut down the engines without an override from a central point. Four Gorkins walked around and checked various holographic displays while a guard stood at attention near the entrance. He could not disable all five at once. So he went to a side hallway and projected a Gorkin walking into it. Mimicking the voice of one was not difficult, and it had drawn the attention of the guard, who moved toward the distraction. Once he arrived, M blasted him with a stun blast. The guard cried out as he fell. M had wanted it to be silent, and the workers would be alerted by now, so he flew into the engine room where they moved around in confusion. He hovered above them and targeted each with his segmented arms, then fired. The workers collapsed. M went to one of their consoles and jacked in. A moment later, the engine systems were down. He wanted to drag the guard into the room, but his orb mode was not strong enough. Although he had used his nanoswarms to move body parts earlier in the cave, those were body parts as opposed to a full body. He exited the room, then sealed the door. The next stop was the command center. That was where the weapons systems were tied to. On the way there, two guards hustled past him. 
He hit both with a stun blast, but detected they had been talking to the command center. He set a new priority on reaching there, and when he did, he scrutinized the now highly alert crew. There was no time for tricks here, and there were six Gorkines. He targeted four and fired stun beams, downing them. One of the Gorkines pulled out a pistol and fired a wide beam in M's direction. M tried to dodge, but got hit. Although not a lethal shot, it was enough to make him crash. When the two remaining Gorkines used cover to approach him, he hit them with a stun blast when they peeked out. It took him a moment to do a system's self-diagnostic. He would not be able to fly in the short term, but he could still use his segmented arms. He crawled like a spider to one of the consoles and connected with it. The weapons system was shut down, and he examined what the Gorkines were reacting to. They had detected unusual activity and had not heard back from the communications room. The more alarming issue was that Aristic had been notified that there was something going on in the ship. He contacted Everin. The Gorkines are aware, but the ship is now disabled. Okay, get out of there and rejoin us on the Toravada. The camp has become more active. I'm going to disable the drones now, then land. Acknowledged, said M. He hoped that his inability to shut down the ship without notification didn't jeopardize the plan. His flight would be back momentarily, so he crawled toward the ship entrance he had used. It was time to enact the next step. Herrick's heart pounded as he stared at the camp. He was on the Torvada's ramp, hovering above the Gorkin camp, ready to go. M had shut down the ship and was on his way back, and the Gorkins had noticed. While not someone who routinely participated in close quarters combat, Herrix figured he was about to get a good dose of it. He checked his upgraded gear. It was from his time period and standard issue for a United Planets Ranger. The tactical body armor had been enhanced and the energy shields made tougher. The AR-12 rifle was also standard issue for a Ranger and could not only stun but also go lethal with ease. It had an energy dagger attached to the side and a scope for long range if needed, although it was mainly used for short to medium combat. M had returned to the ramp and hovered next to Everin, who interacted with something invisible in front of him. Herrick's turned his head to see several small rods with flexible joints extended from the Toravada's black meshed external panels. They aimed at the drones, then fired. The drones fritzed, then crash landed. Herrick's widened his eyes when Everin strode to the edge of the ramp. His energy shield glowed brightly, and the handle from his belt was now a staff. It was only a moment in time, but Herrick saw the Everin of legend when his outline was sharpened by the Toravada's semi-transparent interior shielding. As if on cue, Everin jumped off and landed, stirring up dirt clouds near the Gorkine ship. The Gorkines immediately engaged him. The Torvada landed between the two ships, its entrance facing the alpaca. Herrix waved forward. That's us. Let's go. He charged out with twenty crew members, including Yulzit, Amanta, and Oming. The Torvada kept the outside cleared of guards. Several workers ran around in confusion, but Herrix ushered them to the Torvada's dimly lit ramp. The Torvada was still hidden and the Gorkines on the other side would see a static image of the alpaca. The first few survivors who ran onto the Toravada showed the others they were being rescued. Some had shouted Herrick's name in surprise, but he could catch up with them later. The outside worker crew was quick to load, and the arduous task of getting the ones inside was starting. Before he went in, he checked on what was going on behind the Toravada. Gorkines were flying everywhere, and weapons fire could be heard. It still boggled his mind that Everin was taking on the majority of them by himself. His speed was unnatural, and he would hit or kick three Gorkines before they could even get a strike off. His staff was powerful and sent many enemies flying back or put them on the ground. The objects on his forearms shot non-stop stun and repulsion beams. There were even a few grappling ones that pulled Gorkines in and clotheslined others. M had flown out and was displaying things on the ground, no doubt sowing confusion. In one instance, he projected the large creatures from the cave, causing some Gorkines to run. He also targeted the dog-like drones. 
Everin and M operated like a duo that had been together for a long time. Herrick barged into the ship. The first Gorkin he met went down in a hail of stun blasts. Herrick soaked in the moment. Everything in him wanted to kill the guard. They had murdered and eaten a portion of his crew. Now the enemy was down. Vulnerable. Yulzit stepped forward and aimed. Herrick swallowed his anger, then pushed Yulzit's rifle down. No. No killing. We follow Everin's rules. Yulzit growled. These animals don't deserve to live. I'm in agreement with him, said Oming. Maybe they don't deserve to live. But we do as Everin says. Understood, asked Herrix. Yulzit kicked the downed Gorkin in the leg, then faced Herrix. Fine. Amanza laid a hand on Yulzit's arm. They pushed deeper into the ship. Any survivors they found were directed to the Torvada. Herrix left members of the breaching crew at various points to serve as waypoints, with Everin and M keeping the Gorkins distracted and the Torvada stunning anything trying to enter the ship, Herrix felt confident about the situation. They came upon a sealed room. It surprised him that there was still power, but he was able to use his authority to bypass the console. Yulzit held his shield forward and stood in front of the door before Herrix unlocked it. Once it opened, Yulzit took the brunt of a blast that sent him sprawling. Herrick stepped in and shot the startled Gorkin. Another one was set upon by the rest of the survivors in the room. Although he tried to get a shot in, the humans ripped the Gorkin to shreds. They weren't content to just take the weapon away. They tore its eyes out, stomped its head, snapped off its fingers, and stabbed it with anything they could get their hands on. Yulzit poked his head in. Whoa. Herrick's cleared his throat. Listen up, everybody. Get outside. There's a ship awaiting you. You came for us, said a man with misted eyes. Captain Herrick's, shouted another person. The group chanted. Herrick's got goosebumps. He wasn't expecting anything like this. However, he didn't want to get distracted with others to save. He shook hands and received pats and swats on the arm as the survivors filed out. After they were all evacuated, Herrix moved on. Wonder if they thought we died? Asked Amanza. No idea. But they know a rescue when they see one, said Herrix. According to the rough scan from the Toravada, the ship was being drained of survivors. Some wandered aimlessly, probably from the guards abandoning their posts, and Herrix sent them on their way. There was one large group ahead. I think the Gorkins herded what they could into the mess hall, said Oming. I do too. And that room has a manual lock inside. I won't be able to unseal it if the Gorkins have locked it, said Herrix. He waved forward. Let's find out. They hustled to the mess hall. Herrix interacted with the nearby console, but it was locked as he had feared. Well, shit. How are we getting through that? That's two feet of solid metal on top of the shielding. We could probably dematerialize the metal, but not the shielding, said Yulzit, running a hand along the door. I don't know, said Herrix. He contacted Everin over comms. We've come across a section of the ship that's sealed, and we can't get through. I'm on my way, said Everin. The Gorkines outside the ship have been neutralized, and M is dealing with those coming in from patrols. Sounds good, said Herrix. He addressed the remaining ten members of his group. You heard him. The Gorkines were neutralized, and he's on his way. The group cheered. If they didn't believe in Everin's ability before, they did now. After ten minutes, Everin arrived. It's good to see you, said Herrix. He tapped the door. There's the obstacle. They've activated internal shielding. The mess hall was meant to break away and is space-worthy and shielded. I never imagined it would be enacted in this scenario. You must have scared them hard. Perhaps, Everin scanned the door. There is a weak spot in the shields under the room. I can breach that and enter the room, then unlock this. Be ready to evacuate the survivors. How are you getting underneath? It's collapsed down there, said Amanza. A nanobot swarm. I will drop down a bit away from here. Prepare yourselves, said Everin. He took off. Yulzit chuckled. It's like he has a solution for everything. Trust me. From what I've read, that's not unusual, 
said Herricks. He waited with bated breath for the shielding to drop and the doors to open. He took the moment to reflect on the overall status. The rescue was going smoothly, the Gorkines disabled, and there was somewhere to go after it was all said and done. All it took was the Torvada deciding to come. He wondered if it was because of his connection to Jane Trellis. That would assume the Torvada had some sort of emotion. How it picked where to travel remained a mystery. After ten minutes, the shielding dropped. Get ready, said Herricks, raising his weapon along with the others. The doors whooshed open, and a Gorkine fell forward. Everin stood in the middle, directing survivors to the exit. Two Gorkines lay silent, and next to Everin was a hole that he probably used to get in. A loud noise filled the air. Everin went to the back and guided some survivors who could barely walk. Halfway to the door, he aimed at the exit. It's going to collapse. Get out of the room, said Everin. He fired a repulsion beam that sent some of the evacuees out the door. Others near the door were pulled out. Herrick's mouth went dry when tons of metal came crashing down. Everin was tough, but Herrick's wasn't sure if that was enough to survive that. Everin. No response. M. Everin's trapped. Acknowledged. I'm on my way, said M. Herricks faced his crew and the survivors. Get to the Torvada. Yulzit, gather some crew and bring back the dissembling tools. We're getting Everin out. Yulzit motioned at the others. Let's go. Herricks would stay and try to help Everin. Maybe he was knocked out. The fact he put himself in a risky situation just to save the crew was the Everin he had read of, but Herricks never expected to see it. Everin, said Herricks. No response. A knot formed in his throat. He would do everything in his power to get Everin out. Thankfully, M was on his way, and the fact he didn't sound too worried calmed Herrick some. Maybe Everin's communication setup was damaged. Until he was freed, Herrick's would be a ball of nervousness. He leaned against a wall. All he could do was wait for M. Chapter 7 M now back in his body, had connected with Everin on the way to Herricks's location. Although Everin was not physically hurt, he was prone and holding tons of infrastructure that was trying to crush him. Herricks visibly relaxed when M arrived. My analysis shows that Everin is okay, but he's in a tough spot, said M. When his body is under immense pressure, his form slows and shuts down. I'll dig him out. Herricks pointed down the tunnel. My crew is bringing a disassembler and can help. There's no need, said M. I'll perform a structural analysis scan of the area, then use my nanobot swarm to remove specific pieces. There is a slight possibility this may not work. Your efforts would be better utilized in moving the Gorkines to a centralized location, stripping them of weapons and handcuffing them. Herricks exhaled. You're probably right. We'd just get in your way. M laid a hand on his shoulder. Your commitment to help is recognized and appreciated. Thanks, said Herricks. He puffed his cheeks. All right. Let me know if you need us. Acknowledged. Herricks took off. His dedication to Everin was evident and M suspected Herricks and his group would have gotten Everin out on their own. It would have taken longer and perhaps been more dangerous, but they would have eventually succeeded. M entered the demolished room and pulsed several scans. Everin resided two levels lower and underneath a large slab. Although it would have crushed a normal organic being, it just lay on top of Everin. It was not heavy enough to crush him, but M could tell how much pressure it exerted by how much of Everin's cosmic energy effort was allocated to keeping the plane form stable. M diagnosed a series of removals that would alleviate the pressure without causing more. It would also end up with him at the slab, which would then be a simpler removal. Slats on his upper arms opened, and two nanoswarms flew out. He directed them to several big chunks of metal sitting in the hole. As the nanoswarms disassembled the material, M had them deposited outside the ship. 
It added time, but it was a safe place to put it. After the top debris was removed, he concentrated on boring a tunnel that would be wide enough for him to drop down. He needed to account for the impact of removing parts that might be balanced against other areas. One slip-up could make it worse. He exited his body mode and flew his orb down into the hole being created. This allowed him to get a better view of the situation. Everin was 16 feet away, and although M wanted to bore faster, he had to be cautious. As he got closer to Everin, the surrounding ship groaned. Some of the upper parts he had thought were stable were not. After flying back up some, he widened the hole. A pulse scan verified it was okay to continue. After 15 minutes, M reached the slab on top of Everin. M's nanobots made quick work of the slab by breaking off the ends first, then taking away the middle segment. Everin lay still, but M sensed Everin's cosmic energy already reasserting itself. M flew back up into body mode, then used his dimensional foot thrusters to allow for a controlled descent. After picking Everin up, M ascended, then carried him out of the ship. M wasted no time in getting him to the medical lab and laying him on a special slab. Several beams connected to him from mechanical arms that extended out of the slab's base, and per M's analysis, Everin would be back to normal in approximately ten minutes. M went into orb mode and used the time to check outside the Torvada. Herrix and several of his men had dragged the Gorkines to a central area and put them in a circle. The handcuffs were standard to issue United Planets ones. M detected two dead Gorkines in the distance. He flew over and scanned them. Herrix joined him. Will Everin be okay? Yes, said M. It'll take ten minutes before he's back to normal. That's a relief. Damn, he's tough. He is. About these two said Herrix, gesturing at the two Gorkeen corpses. They woke up and tried to fight us. One of our crew tried to use a stun baton, but was killed. Our response was... immediate. A ranged weapon would have been preferable, said M. Herrix frowned. I know. It's just that some of the crew wanted to be up close and personal. Nonetheless... I think we got all the Gorkines you and Everin stunned. I don't know about the ones on the ship. M had the Torvata scan the ship, which showed that some of the Gorkines had awakened already. We'll put all of these Gorkines on their ship. However, first, I need to clear it again. We can help, said Herrix. Although not wanting to place Herrix and the crew at risk, M also understood that humans liked to be part of the solution. Most, that is. The ones from the era Herrix was from tended to be more selfless, a trait that did not seem to get passed on down the line to other evolutions of humanity. I would normally suggest it would be too dangerous, but you and your crew can handcuff the ones I deal with. I need to take point on this. Although I control their systems, it appears some have armed themselves. Said M. Herrix nodded. We got your back. M peered behind him for a moment, then looked forward. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. As am I. Said M. He retrieved his robot body then walked over to the Gorkine's ship entrance and waited until the Herrix and several men joined him. After opening the door, M marched in. A Gorkine shot at him, but the energy blast didn't impact his shielding. M shot a stun beam in the assailant's direction. The attacker collapsed. Herrix and his men moved in and handcuffed the Gorkine while M continued on. He had already connected back into the ship's systems, which showed that the Gorkines had formed small groups. The engine room was the first target since the Gorkines were attempting to unlock the system he had locked. When he entered, the workers opened fire. M took away the weapon of the first attacker, then moved his arms in an efficient manner to hit the other three workers with a stun beam. The one whose weapon had been taken away received a shock from M's hand. It's clear, said M. Herrix and his men dashed in and handcuffed the downed assailants. 
M analyzed the engine system and calculated that they would have manually overridden the system in time. The remaining Gorkins on the ship befell the same fate as the engineering crew. Do not handcuff the ones here in the command center, said M. You sure? asked Terex. Yes, I'll activate a distress beacon, and when these Gorkins wake up, they can deal with freeing their crew and taking back control. We'll be long gone by then. What about capturing them and having them face justice? asked one man. We have enough evidence without needing to take prisoners. Another man scoffed. We could just destroy this damn ship. M faced him. Everin would never condone that. Nor would I. These bastards killed and ate our crew, hunted us like animals, and worked us like slaves. Herrick growled. Stand down. The decision's been made, and that's what we'll do. The man shrugged and looked away. M understood the anger the survivors must be feeling. To be standing in their attacker's ship with the crew disabled was an opportunity for revenge. However, M would not allow that. Begin bringing in the other Gorkings. You can place them wherever, he said. You got it, said Herrix. He faced his men. Let's get to it. When the man had spoken up, several of the others had nodded. It was subtle, but showed that if M had not been there, there might have been dead Gorkines. Thankfully, Herrix kept his crew in line. The worst-case scenario would have been M having to incapacitate them. He focused on a holographic version of Everin that only he could see. I'm awake, said Everin. Are you okay? Yes, said Everin. However, I do not know what the situation is. I'm relaying you a status report, said M. Everin paused. I see. It seems you were able to retrieve me without loss of any of the crew. The Gorkin situation also appears to be handled. Yes, and I've enacted your plan for the Gorkins. Excellent. Once they are loaded and everyone is on the Torvada, we can locate the other survivors, then deal with removing the alpaca by using the planner generator beam. I'll be here coordinating everything until then. Acknowledged. Although there had been several survivor deaths, the plan had succeeded. After they left the planet would be another matter since that would introduce galactic politics, something M was glad that Everin excelled in. Herrix understood his crew's anger at the Gorkines. He felt it himself. However, Everin and M didn't want them killed, just stunned and placed on the ship, and that was what would happen. Herrix let slide a few kicks and punches while loading. They weren't fatal hits, so it followed in the spirit of Everin and M's decision. It still boggled his mind that Everin had survived a section of the ship being dropped on him. If it had been a survivor, that would have been instant death. It showed how powerful he was. M being able to navigate the structural concerns while making a hole was also impressive. Herrix inspected the six Gorkines with shallow breathing that had been left in a mess hall. They had been placed against a series of large containers. He swallowed hard as revenge bubbled inside him. They had a nice, comfortable life for the last year while they preyed on his crew. It gave him immense satisfaction to see them powerless, and he fully understood the desire to wipe them out. He jumped when Emma walked up next to him. I thought you went to the Torvata. M scanned the room. I will once all the Gorkines are loaded. Is everything okay? Yeah, for the moment. I hope we can still look for the other group that split off long ago. That is our next step. We plan to travel back and follow their route, then return to the present to rescue them. Afterward, we will remove any trace of the alpaca. Herrick smiled at M. I look forward to it. Everything seemed to be going well for the moment. The Gorkines were almost all loaded, Everin was okay, and the survivors plus his crew were getting settled. He took off to the Torvada to check on the new members of the crew. When he entered the medical lab, he widened his eyes at the number of people there. He walked over to Everin. Probably didn't expect this many, huh? 
It's not a problem, said Everin, interacting with something invisible. A moment later, the lab extended, creating hundreds of new slabs. Herrick's caught his breath. It amazed him that the Torvada could expand into whatever was needed. Those who did not have a slab eagerly went to one. Scans were performed, but the downside was that there were only so many medical personnel to handle things. The automatic scans that occurred with a menu above each patient intrigued him. When they selected something, wires, tools on segmented tendrils, and tubes extended out of the slab's sides. They're self-servicing, he said. Indeed, said Everin. That should assist with the medical personnel issue. I was just thinking how we wouldn't be able to help everyone, but for basic things, this works. The slabs can perform any operation as needed, including bioprogramming, said Everin. No kidding. Everin half smiled. None. Herrick's ran a hand over his mouth. The United Planets had advanced self-servicing labs, but nothing that could do what the Toravada did. It was another example of how technologically advanced the Toravada was. By the way, I'm glad you're okay, he said. Thank you, said Everin. My structural analysis must have missed something. I can only imagine that you would have seen the stress points, but there are so many variables to predict. You're correct, and thankfully it worked out. Everin's calm demeanor relaxed Herrick's. Cool under pressure only scratched the surface of what Everin was. A scuffed-up little boy ran up and hugged Everin. He rubbed the boy's back. You're safe now. A man with watery eyes walked up and touched the boy's shoulder while nodding at Everin. They went to find a slab. They're calling you and M saviors, said Herricks. I'm just someone who helped, said Everin. Herricks laughed. <laughs> That's a bit modest. You're a force of nature, and we're thankful we were in your path. I go where the Torvada leads me. Yeah, but you could also just ignore situations. But you don't, said Herrix. That's what makes you special. You have all this power and you use it for good. Relatively good for us, bad for the Gorkines. It's unusual for someone with so much power to not try to wield it against others for personal gain. Everin glanced at him. My personal gain is that people are helped, and I like to see that. Herricks grinned, and that's why you're special. He gestured at the new extended part of the lab. This is more than I could have ever asked for. If we can find the other group that split off a year ago... I think we'll be ready to start a new chapter somewhere. Indeed. We'll do that first, then come back to a moment after we left to remove any evidence of the alpaca. It's appreciated. Herrick rubbed his chin. Is the alpaca removal so others won't be able to salvage it? Not quite, said Everin. The main reason is that it is a part of a time travel event. Therefore, it should be removed. The secondary reason is that it should not influence the natural evolution of this planet. Although the Gorkines claim control over it, they seem to be keeping it free of development. We will find out why later. Makes sense, said Herrix. He eyed Everin. You remove a lot of things from time, I bet. But you also save some people. Like Jane, from an errant timeline. Everin's eyes softened. Yes. Herrix was glad Everin had rescued her. He now firmly believed that was the event that made the Torvada decide to come to this point, since he was a direct descendant. What confused him was there were probably many incidents in the future the Torvada could have chosen, and maybe it still would. He followed Everin to the living quarters. It did Herrix proud to see his camp assisting those fresh from the ship. Joyful reunions abounded, and the excitement was palpable. He chuckled when he saw large tables packed with food and drinks. That was for those who still had not gotten a room. He had wondered how the rooms would be assigned, and it turned out to be first come, first served. I'm beginning to think it might be helpful to give everyone some time here before going to a new civilization. I concur, said Everin. There will be some adjustment to a new normal before being introduced to yet another situation. 
I suspect your crew will enjoy feeling rested and safe after their ordeal. Herrick swallowed hard. Yeah, we've been through a lot. Everin squeezed his arm. You and your crew will be okay now. I hope so. Everin tilted his head. M says the Gorkines are loaded, and that he and your crew are on their way back. Let's go to the command center to await them. Herricks helped a few survivors before going to the command center. He was both saddened and excited by the situation. Finding the other third of his crew might not yield anything, but he was glad the attempt was being made. He had already contacted his command group to meet up. They had been eager to round up the Gorkines on their ship. The command center had spawned a two-deep row of seats, about ten in all. Herricks sat on the far left one on the first row. Everin was in his command chair behind the seats. Herricks was honored that Everin treated him as if he were part of the normal crew. It was probably nothing for Everin to do that, but for Herricks, it was everything. Oming, Yulzit, Amanza, M, and Tarek, a leader from the ship survivors, arrived and took seats to the right of Herricks. M had taken his position at a workstation next to Everin. All personnel have been accounted for, said M. Everin tapped at his command chair console. Excellent. Take us back to the Gorkine's initial assault that caused the crew to split. That's possible? asked Tarek, looking at the others. Oh yeah, said Yulzit. Prepare for your mind to be blown. The Toravada ascended. Tarek peered behind at Everin. We're so thankful for the rescue. Of course, said Everin. However, it was a team effort and made possible by the efforts of M and Herricks and his command crew. Tarek swept his gaze across the group. I don't know how much longer we could have held out. We are forever in your debt. Herricks raised his head. We don't leave crew behind, even if it takes over a year. Here, here, said Yulzit. Herricks got goosebumps. Hope had established a foothold in him, and to see Tarek, a civilian, rise as a leader was a testament to the crew's resiliency. Although Herrick didn't know him as a passenger, he had been the unofficial leader of the humans at the ship. Many a time he had stood up to the Gorkines, and although most interactions didn't go his way, some did. The Torvada reached low orbit. Tarek gasped when everything outside faded away. What's going on? We've gone back in time to the point the Gorkines arrived, said M. By the time we reach the ship, they will have started their assault. Can't we just stop them now? Save all the deaths and pain? Oming shook his head. It's history and can't be altered. He crooked a thumb at Everin. Otherwise, it would have already been done. You're correct. We're here as observers only, said Everin. Tarek took a deep breath when the Torvada descended. Herricks understood where Tarek was coming from. It would be easy for Everin and M to stop the Gorkines before they even entered the atmosphere. However, Herricks realized that would interfere with their meeting. Still, it was hard to be an observer in a situation like this. The Torvada reached the crashed alpaca where the Gorkines had begun their attack. Tarek scowled. Those damn Gorkines! Amanza squeezed his arm. He licked his lips as he faced forward. The Torvada highlighted a group of survivors that took off in the opposite direction from Herricks's group. Communications officer Zillerich led the group. He had ensured they kept together while dodging fire from enemy drones. The few Gorkin soldiers who chased after them were shaken off in the nearby forest, but the drones were relentless. Herricks grimaced when a helpless crew got downed. However, some still possessed weaponry. Zillerich had the group spread out, and when the drones attempted to attack someone near a tree, the defenders focus-fired back. This technique eliminated all but three drones. Their group continued to move, and eventually downed two of the drones. When they reached a fast-moving river, they were exposed. However, with so much firepower, the last drone stood no chance. Now that they were free for the moment, they walked alongside the river. Herricks suspected they were looking for a way to cross. There were 144 survivors, per a data label the Toravada provided. 
Herricks did the math, and between his group and this one, that was around 300 or so that escaped. The other 500 were captured, with a portion killed in the initial assault. That meant the Gorkins killed or ate around 200 or so of the crew at the ship. A look over at the others confirmed they probably had done a similar calculation. Zilrich's group eventually found a land bridge and crossed it. They entered a valley nestled between two mountains, and while the place initially was inviting, they had to fight unusually large insects. The group was successful for the most part, but some survivors were chomped on, so the remainder wasted no time in traversing the valley. After several hours, they reached a cave entrance. "'What a journey so far,' said Amanza. "'I didn't know Zillerich was a leader. Not by choice.' said Herrix. Yulzit snorted. He's doing damn well. Herrix pointed down. So is this where they would be in the future? Unknown, said Everin. They may have moved on. How do we track them? I have a suggestion, said M. Proceed, said Everin. I can track them. Then I can be picked up a year from now, unless you object. That's a good idea if you wish to do so, said Everin. Herrick drew his head back. You're just gonna hang out for a year. Is this a problem? Asked Em. No, but won't you be lonely? Em smiled. I know the Torvato will return. I'll be okay. All right. Em flew his orb out of his robot body, then exited the Torvato. Although his orb was visible for the most part, Herrick saw the outline on the front wall. M flew fast towards Zilrich's group, then entered the cave after them. Everin interacted with his chair console. Now we go forward a year and pick up M and hopefully all of Zilrich's group. This is crazy, said Tarek. Maybe. But if it works, I'm all for it, said Yulzit. The Torvado went to low orbit, jumped forward in time, then descended. As they approached the cave entrance, Everin tapped at his command chair console. M. We're back. Status report. M's hologram displayed in the front. The crew is ready for pickup. Everin tilted his head. How many survived? 123. The others died to complications and unforeseen encounters. Wow. That's more than I expected, said Herricks. Everin's eyes narrowed. Did you assist them? M's lights dimmed. I couldn't let them die. I understand. I assume you didn't tell them of Terex or Herix's groups. Correct. I did tell them the Torvato would be back, said M. We went deep into the cave and found a place to stay, but everyone is eager to leave. Herrix realized M would have then been on the planet when his group had hidden. He could have reached out, but that would have violated the future meeting. Time travel gave him headaches. Very well, said Everin. I'm bringing the Torvada to the entrance. He surveyed the others. Perhaps it would be best for you all to welcome them. Say no more, said Herrix. He gazed around. Let's go. He gulped when they stood on the ramp. The Torvada had entered the wide cave mouth and landed farther inside than he thought they would go. His throat constricted when Zilrich and a steady stream of survivors exited from various pathways. Herricks led his group outside. Zilrich, said Amanza. It's true. M. You were right, said Zilrich. Tears flowed down his cheeks when he embraced Amanza. Then the others. Captain Herrix, said Zillerich in a weak voice. He shuddered. I tried my best. Herrix laid a hand on his shoulder. I know you did. You did what you could in a crazy situation. But that's the past. We're here now. Zillerich wiped his cheeks. Other survivors burst into the Torvado when M guided them to the dimly lit blue outline of a door. Everin exited and joined them. He greeted Zillerich. You're actually real, said Zillerich. He slapped him on the back. He filled me in, and it was hard to believe. 
but we wouldn't be here without him. His nanoswarm really helped. M's lights glowed. I was a portable matter replicator for some things. That you were. You helped us create a place to live. It was difficult to convince the others to come here now, but our living area has been disassembled. That's good to hear, said Everin. I'm glad you all were able to survive this long without more casualties. Once everyone is settled in, we can talk about the next steps. Zilrich hugged Everin. Thank you. Everin placed a hand on his back. You're welcome. Oming swatted Zilrich's arm. Want a cheeseburger? Oh, yeah, he said. M said there were full matter replicators. I'm ready. Well, come on, then. I'll show you around, said Herrix. Zilrich paused, then looked back at M. You're coming. Right? If you wish. I do. Acknowledged. Herrix could see that Zilrich and M had bonded. It would be an easy bond to form if M had popped out of nowhere in the earlier days and offered assistance. If he then mentioned they would be rescued if they could hold out, that would have given everyone hope. A precious commodity in that situation. Herrix didn't think Everin was too happy about M interfering, but for the moment Everin had accepted it. It was said he had a strong bond with humanity, and by extension so would M. It didn't surprise Herrick's that M interfered. Maybe he was always meant to. Chapter 8 M had retrieved the planner beam generator from the research lab. It was on a hover slab, and he had heard it resembled a cannon from Earth's past. It fired a beam of pure planner energy that eradicated almost anything it touched. The slab had anchored itself on the edge of the Torvada's ramp, and the power cord ran to the lab. It had been challenging to get the generator out while the alpaca's crew was everywhere. Some were interested in what he was doing, and it had taken Zillerich's asking them to back off to let M continue. Although he had formed a strong bond with Zillerich, he had also made other friends in the group. M had been an observer in the first month with Zillerich's band. The cave was massive and had naturally large tunnels that resembled what a big, boring machine carved out. There were smaller paths that led off to other areas, but after a week of going non-stop, they had found a dimly lit cavern. Illumination had been provided by bioluminescent moss. The main feature was a nearby stream of water that was several feet deep. M was not sure where the source was, but his scan indicated it was clean. The group had taken up residence, then immediately searched for food sources. They were not successful, and at the end of the month, Supplies had run out, and some died of starvation. M couldn't stand by, so he had presented himself to the shock of everyone. Some were angry he had shown himself after some had died. He had mentioned that interference was forbidden due to timeline integrity, but they didn't want to hear that. It was Zillerich who defended M, then asked for help. M had converted some purple clay into a paste that could be consumed. There was no shortage of it which allowed everyone to be fed. He did it with his nanoswarms initially, but then he created a device that would handle the conversion. It required energy that M could not provide, but they used their power cells from their weapons. M had then fashioned a water mill to generate power. Although it was not much, it was enough to handle the food converter and other necessities and not require using up the few energy cells they had. He had created storage containers for food and water, bedding areas, bathrooms, and waste disposal. Raw material to convert was all around them. He had also accompanied Zillerich and others in scouting the caves and the occasional foray outside. There was edible fauna that could be gathered, and any wildlife had been documented. Thankfully, there were no large predators. However, there were several insects that proved to be dangerous. One insect was 11 inches long on average, and resembled a centipede. Several had bit some of the survivors, but the bugs were repelled by sonic devices around the edges of the cavern. A snake-like animal had also been caught in the flowing stream, but it was harmless. M heard the sound of footsteps behind him. Zillerich. Not surprised you knew it was me without looking, he said. He studied the generator. 
So what is this thing, exactly? It's a planner beam generator, said M. It can remove any object composed of planner material. Zillerich stared at him. And what would be an example of something not made of planner material? The cosmic energy in Everin and myself. Zillerich's eyes widened. Oh, you've never mentioned cosmic energy over the last year? M faced him. It's not something discussed lightly. I get it. I'm honored that you trust me enough to tell me. As you've experienced the Toravada, that earns trust. Zillerich nodded. So, how's this beam thing work, then? Observe. The Torvada tilted so it was vertical, and the generator fired a beam at a part of the alpaca which dissipated. Zillerich wrinkled his brow. It's so weird to not be falling and... Wow! That shot just made a part of the alpaca disappear. It will take some time to remove all of it, said M. Then I hope I'm not bothering you by being here. M tilted his head. I can multitask with ease. I enjoy your presence. I do too, said Zillerich, grinning. M smiled. You know our group considers you a hero. I understand, said M. I wasn't to engage your group, but I couldn't stand by and do nothing. I did appreciate your helping the others to understand my predicament when I revealed myself. Zillerich chuckled. <laughs> I was just happy to know we weren't alone. We weren't going to make it. Is Everin angry at you for helping us? M paused. No. He respects my decision to interfere if needed, since he knows I wouldn't have easily arrived at that conclusion. Good. It's still hard to fathom that we're all here on the Toravata with the other crews. And you all will soon be with the nearest human civilization. Zilrich ran a hand over his mouth. Yeah. And from what Captain Herrix said, they're far more advanced than us. You're all human, and my experience has been that humans as a species adapt when needed. This group is hardened and has gone through a brutal situation. I have no doubt you will thrive wherever you go, said M. Zillerich raised his head. We will. I just wish you and Everin would stay with us. But I understand you have other obligations. Where will you go after all this? Earth. We've been away from it for too long. Any particular time period? M gazed out. 2014. Zilrich eyed him. A very specific year. Do you and Everin just travel around randomly? No. The Torvada gives summonses to deal with that take us to a point in space and time or beyond. Then we handle whatever the summons is for. However, we can choose where we go and what we do between those. 2014 Earth is a special place and time for us. I guess so. I'm hoping you two will visit after we've settled. And put out his hand for a high five. You may count on it. Zillerich laughed as he returned it. Works for me. M got an alert from the Toravada that a ship had entered orbit. Based on the design, it was a Gorkine ship, but it was much larger than the one on the ground. A Gorkine ship has entered orbit, he said. Zillerich tilted his head back. They can't see us, right? Correct, but they would see the beam. So what do we do? M stopped the planner beam generator. I'll confer with Everin. The ship is currently scanning this location and has altered its course. That can't be good. Zillerich motioned outward. How's the Torvata shielding? Nothing of planner origin can penetrate it. It's a dimensional void. Zillerich furrowed his brow. How is that possible? The Torvata is powered by a dimension. And the shielding is an extension of that. 
said Em. That's just crazy. So we have nothing to fear from that ship, then? Yes. Let's go to the command center. Herrick's stomach churned as he scrutinized the new Gorkine ship. It was huge relative to the one he knew of. Everin sat in his chair, and M had stopped using the planner beam generator and came in to take his place at his workstation. Herrick's had summoned his command crew, and Zilrich and Tarek had also come. A holographic representation of the Gorkine ship filled the front of the room. Dread surged in Herrick's, but he knew they were safe on the Toravada. Per the data labels, the Gorkine ship was a cruiser of some type. A series of smaller ships and drones surrounded the cruiser, which reminded him of a large arrowhead with three massive circles on the bottom. Along the sides were central round thrusters, and the top also had thrusters. This would allow the ship to maneuver effortlessly. This area is being scanned, said M. Everin's eyes narrowed. Move us away from here. As if on cue, a massive, wide, golden beam shot down from the cruiser. The Gorkin ship on the ground and the alpaca were pulverized immediately. Herrick's froze as the Toravada was pushed deep into the ground. He had thought he would get tossed around, and based on the others' reactions, they did too. It still boggled his mind to think of what type of power could provide such stability. The beam from above kept firing. Everything outside turned into molten rock. It was an unusual feeling to be buried in a ship. Since the beam could not penetrate the shielding, the Torvada sank even deeper. Everin and M remained calm, which helped soothe nerves in the room. M increased shield temperature. When capable, move to the side, said Everin. Acknowledged. Herrick stared at a data window that showed the Torvada's shielding temperature climb. He was not sure what Everin meant about moving to the side. Once the shielding reached a high temperature, the Toravada burst to the side and melted through rock. Since they were still being pushed, a space was carved out. After a moment, there was enough area outside the beam's path for the Toravada to hold its place. Everyone but Everin and M stood and stared at the gold beam that filled the hole they had been in. So they're firing still, said Oming. Herrick ran a hand over his mouth. Seems like it. I can't believe they destroyed their own ship. Yulzit shook his head. Destroy all evidence that there was anything ever here. They're covering this up. Don't worry, said Averin. We will capture them doing so. How? asked Amanza. By traveling back to a point before they arrived and recording them. However, for the moment, we can wait here until the beam is finished and they've scanned the area. Once that is done, we'll leave and go back in time to record. Then we will move someplace less busy to acclimate the crew to a new normal before going to the Benetton Collective. Zilrich wagged a finger. Oh, that's smart. You and M are so calm throughout this. I'm not surprised. Tarek shuddered. I am. This is nuts. We should have been ripped to shreds. I understand, said Everin. The Torvata shielding is quite powerful. I guess so. Everin looked at M. When the beam is finished, take us out to orbit after the cruiser scans the area to confirm everything was destroyed, then jump back a few minutes before the cruiser arrives. Acknowledged. Herrix continued to focus on the beam outside. It was not too far away, and the fact the Torvada could move to the side and then out of the beam's path was impressive. He knew the shielding was tough, and this just showed how much. He grimaced when he thought of the alpaca's destruction. It had been his home away from home and served him well through thick and thin. It didn't deserve to be crippled, dismantled, and finally dissipated. It had pained him to know the planner beam generator was doing it, but he understood why. It still infuriated him that the alpaca's demise came at the hands of the Gorkines. After five minutes, the beam stopped. They're scanning the hole, said M, as expected. They won't detect us said Everin. Zilrich puffed his cheeks. So will the Benetton Collective want to see the video feed of that ship firing on us? I expect so. Once we arrive, there will be some questions, and I suspect we'll be pulled into a meeting of some type. Having this type of information is valuable in that regard. I'd say so. 
said Herrix, although they could say it was fake. Everin smiled. Then a more direct approach will be needed. If need be, we will take a delegation to prove we can time travel. That's a good tactic. It would be hard to deny that, said Herrix. Let's hope so. Their scan is complete, and they're leaving, said M. Take us out, said Everin. Acknowledged. Herrick's held his breath when the Torvada jarred itself loose, then went back into the hole. As it rapidly ascended, he worried they might be detected, but if they were, the beam would just push them back down. The Gorkines probably would not be able to detect the Torvada in that scenario. He relaxed when they exited and flew off to the side. A zoomed-in window showed the cruiser moving away. The Torvada reached low orbit, then jumped back in time. We're one minute away from the arrival of the Gorkian cruiser, said M. Zillerich's eyes widened. So that's what time travel looks like. That easing and fading out thing is unnerving. M glanced at him. We exited the timeline and re-entered at a new set of coordinates. Got it. But that's still unnerving. The Gorkine cruiser was highlighted once within range. It apparently did not detect the Torvada when it settled into orbit over the crash site. The myriad of data labels fascinated Herrix. It had weapon readouts, shielding strength displays, life sign readings, thruster power levels, and even traced what he assumed were communication signals. The scan had no color, but the Torvada showed the outline of it. Herrix furrowed his brow as he read the scan results. The cruiser was determining what was on the ground, and it had found the grounded Gorkine ship and the alpaca. It had also detected the planner beam generator, but not the source. Weapon systems are being deployed, said M. Herrick stared at the massive arms that reached out to support a large cannon emerging from the underside. He had seen something similar in his era, but they were meant to wipe anything off the face of a planet. Everyone but Everin and M jumped when a beam burst forward. Herrick's heart accelerated when the golden ray of death hit the ground and continued to create a deep hole. He remembered this part well, but to see it from above showed how much power had been used. It gave him a new appreciation for the Torvada's shielding. Even more intriguing to him was that, once again, there was an earlier version of himself in the same point in time. After a while, the beam stopped and the Gorkine ship did another scan before turning to leave. M. Take us to intergalactic space and the present before we left to come here, said Everin. Acknowledged. Everin looked around. We'll stay there for a month in order for everyone to acclimate to being aboard the Torvada and to interact with each other without the threat of death. Also, we'll need to make sure everyone understands the situation and that we'll be going to the Benetton Collective after a month. M tilted his head. We could talk to our contact there discreetly. Perhaps he can come aboard and we can talk. We can look into that, said Everin. However, for everyone else, let's get them settled in. Chapter 9 Herrix yawned as he stared at the ceiling. The previous two weeks had been good to him. Having a working matter replicator in his room made getting food and drink easy. He ran a hand over his stomach and realized he might need to slow down some there. It was 9 o'clock a.m., and he swore the bed had some impact since he had been having great sleep. Being able to have a daily sonic shower never got old. He had acclimated to having a cup of coffee in the morning and a sip of cinnamon whiskey, an old earthborn drink he loved, before bed. His days had been split up into various segments. The first part he went around and talked with anyone available. It was his way of seeing how people were adjusting and also showing his presence. The second segment was around lunchtime, and he spent that with his command crew that now had Tarek and Zilrich in it. He enjoyed the relaxed atmosphere and, more importantly, being able to discuss various administrative aspects and their next steps. The third segment was usually him doing another sweep among the people and then meeting with Everin and M. After that was dinner. Then he took some alone time in one of the many hollow rooms. His command crew had impressed him. Amanza had stepped up and made medical lab visits effortless. 
She had reported that almost everyone had been checked and was healthy or on the mend from other injuries and diseases. Even those who had problems the United Planets could not deal with in their time period were handled. Brain cancer was usually lethal, even in Herrick's era. But on the Torvada, it was a simple bioprogramming session of about ten minutes. Zilrich and Tarek held daily open forums with anyone who wanted to attend. They made sure that everyone had the same information and that they were being taken care of. Herrick sometimes went to them, as did the other members of the command crew. Yulzit ran a combat training program that was wildly successful with the survivors. Civilians who had never wielded a weapon before were a large portion of the attendees. Oming used the research lab to teach engineering topics to those interested. There were more students there than Herricks had planned for. Everin and M were frequent visitors, and Herricks attended a few classes. Oming knew his stuff, and with Everin and M sometimes giving a guest lecture, everything felt normal for a change. However, today was special. Adunetis, a former leader in the Benetton Collective, was coming to meet with Everin. There was a second part to Adunetis' name, but it was a unique symbol that probably was not meant for verbal usage. It differentiated him from others with the same name. It was technical to Herricks, almost like a house insignia, but maybe it was not too unusual given that these humans were mostly cyborgs. Everin and M had moved the Toravada into Benetton space and were headed to a remote planet in their collective. Adunetis had requested a specific location outside the collective's surveillance. Herrix understood the need for privacy, and he was not sure how Adunetis viewed this situation or even what he knew. Whatever it was, the meeting was in an hour, so Herrix hopped up and got moving. Forty-five minutes later, he assembled with the command crew on the roof while Everin and M were on the ramp. The Torvada had landed on a barren, sand-filled planet. The split in a rock structure had created a miniature oasis of strange plant life and small insects, but there was enough space for several ships to land inside. Herricks was glad to be on the roof since the temperature outside showed it would be uncomfortable for a human— it made him wonder about the life that had evolved. Although there was some shade from the rock outcroppings, the two suns ensured there was plenty of sunlight. He examined the ship the Toravada had highlighted in orbit. It resembled a long cylinder with thick round plates that extended past each end. However, it was the fast-approaching egg-shaped craft that caught his eye. It was obvious, by the friction being generated, that shielding was used to create an efficient aerodynamic shape. Oming's eyes widened. The amount of power needed to sustain a shield like that would be immense. I'm guessing this isn't a one-time entry vehicle. Probably not, said Herricks. The ship moved much faster than Herricks thought it should. He had seen many alien ships and a variety of technologies, but nothing like this. After fifteen minutes, the craft hovered a few feet off the ground. A liquid poured out, solidifying into a cradle with a ramp. Everin and M exited the Toravada's shielding. Adunetis walked down the ramp that materialized. He wore a single silver suit with black segmented armored pads on his arms, legs, and chest. His purple skin, bald head with unusual circuitry-like patterns and thick neck collar gave off a strange vibe. However, it was the almost white eyes that stood out. Adonetis stood around four feet tall with a very athletic build. It was like the suit he wore could barely contain his muscles. Two small orbs followed him. That's... different, said Tarek. Herrix pointed out, they're talking... Let's be glad we can hear them. Everin slightly bowed with his left hand across his stomach. It's good to see you again, Adunetis. M performed the same action. Likewise, said Adunetis, his eyes turning blue when he dipped his head. New forms, I see. What happened to your other ones? They died, said Everin. Adunetis paused. Intriguing. Only you would know how to contact me with the code you gave. 
He looked Em over. I see you four has a new body. I'm Em now, but I have her memories. Adonetus eyed him. Interesting. Nonetheless, your new body appears to be efficient. I don't recognize some of the technology. That's rare. I assume this isn't a social call, and I appreciate you not discussing any topic outside of this meeting. No one knows we're here, and only you would know its significance. Herrix noted the short and abrupt nature of Adonetus. He had a cold feel to him, despite Everin saying he was friendly. It made Herrix wonder what an unfriendly Benetton was like. Everin did a quick frown on the mention of Eufor's name. They probably had a strong bond, similar to the one he had with M. So what topic are we discussing? Asked Adonetus. Everin showed a projection of the planet the alpaca crashed on. A human ship from 4732 A.D. went through a space and time portal and crash-landed here, the Tauran system. That's unclaimed, an agreed-upon neutral region, said Adonetus. Perhaps, but the Gorkines maintain a satellite there. When the UPS alpaca from the United Planets crashed, the Gorkines tortured, enslaved, ate or killed over half their crew in a year's time. Adonetus drew his head back. They're not allowed to maintain any type of presence there, much less attack humans. They did, and I have evidence of that. Adonetus stared at him. I assume you have the survivors on the Torvata. We do, said Everin, and with dimensional mechanics, not an issue. A technology we would still like to understand. Adonetus inspected M. That must be what I'm detecting on you and Everin. Yes, said M. Everin raised a finger. I must limit knowledge pollution. Usually it's us saying that, said Adonetus. I assume that, since this is a time travel event, the alpaca humans can't go back to their time. So you brought them here? Yes, the Benetton Collective is the only place in this time period where they would be welcome. Adonetus paused. I see why you came to me first. You want to know the best way to present them to the Benetton Senate. If you have time for us, yes, said Everin. We can never repay our debt to you for saving us during the purge long ago. Your actions are why we exist today. Although your name is stricken from public record, per your request, it carries tremendous weight among us survivors, including the Senate. Everin dipped his head toward the Toravada. Perhaps you should meet with the leaders of this human group. Your insights on their situation and actions to be taken would be helpful. Of course. Lead on. Herrick's jumped when Everin's hologram was projected behind the command crew. Please meet us in the conference room that we have been meeting at, said Everin. Herrick's enjoyed seeing a slice of Everin's life. Herrick's did not know what the purge was about, but it had been done with another form of Everin and M, and it had saved the Benettons. It felt like Everin was calling in a favor to resettle Herrick's crew. He wasn't going to argue with that. M had recollected U4's memories when last interacting with the Benetton Collective. It was known as the Tarago Empire back then. He had caught Everin's reaction to U4's name, despite his trying to hide it. When M was U4, he had a female persona and had been with Everin's previous form for hundreds of years. M still remembered everything U4 and V had done and was able to simulate what they must have felt. He scanned the conference room and was interested in how Herrick's command crew would react to Adonetus, who had just entered. There was some nervousness, although Yulzit remained calm. That would be normal for him based on what M had seen so far. Zillerich was also relaxed. Everin stood at the entrance. With me is Adonetus, a former leader in the Benetton Collective. 
He has a unique insight into how things work there, and I've asked him to apprise us of the best approach in introducing the alpaca crew. Although he doesn't speak Cregan, he'll appear to do so via the Toravada's translator. If it can't find a direct translation, it will use the nearest term. Herrick stepped forward and extended a hand. Captain Herrick's trellis. Adonetus studied the hand, then looked at Everin. He smiled. Humans use handshakes from their era as a sign of greeting. Adonetus returned the shake. I see. Why would you speak Cregan? Herrick glanced at the others, then back at him. They were the largest empire in the United Planets. It was what everyone spoke. Are Cregan still around? No. They disappeared a long time ago. Although we do find a lot of their artifacts, said Audinetus. That's crazy, said Oming. Audinetus eyed him. I'm not sure what a mental state has to do with this. Oming chuckled. <laughs> Sorry, I just meant it's strange to think of the Cregans not being around. I see. Yulzit drew his head back. Speaking of culture, how do you greet people? Is it just a head dip? That, and my eyes turn blue to indicate acknowledgement, said Adonetus. Huh, I don't have an eye augment, but that would be possible. Adonetus' eyes turned blue as he dipped his head at the others in sequence. Everin tapped a chair nearest to the entrance. You can sit there. Adonetus complied. Everin sat on the opposite end, and Herrix took his seat with the others on the sides. Adonetus gestured around. Everin says you're all human, and I trust his word. We are, said Herrix, just from an earlier point in time. Intriguing. Our historical society would have great interest in speaking with you, and I assume you have a lot of other information about the period in digital format. We do, said Oming, out of curiosity. Which planet did you all come from? asked Adonetus. Most of us are from Fredoria, said Amanza. Adonetus' eyes glowed green. Ah. The birthplace of humanity. Herrick shook his head. That be Earth. Audinetus sat up. And you? Know where that is? Of course. Audinetus focused on him. That will settle quite a few debates. Nonetheless, I'm sorry to hear what happened with the Gorkines. They're a brutal, selfish race, but also highly intelligent. The fact any of you survived is impressive. Herrick cleared his throat. We adapted. Understood. How many survived? About 550 or so out of 800 plus. Adonetus frowned. That is tragic. The Gorkines must pay for that. Herrick sighed. Yeah, we're with you there. Are the Gorkines part of the Convax Federation? asked Yulzit. They are, said Audinetus. If what Everin says is true, then they have a lot to answer for. Zillerich crossed his arms. So, what's our next step? One of Audinetus' orbs hovered over the table. It projected a galactic regional view. You will need to meet with the Benetton Senate first, said Audinetus although it would take you months to do so. With Everin's presence, this would be sped up to an immediate meeting. He has that much sway. There should be no issue with your resettlement. The orb showed several cities from an isometric view with areas highlighted around them. Audinetus continued, I would suggest that you create a living space on the edge of a large city, like the ones shown in these images. There will be several planets and cities to choose from, but in essence, you'd be given everything you need to fashion an area unique to your group. You would also have access to the nearby city and would be inducted as members of the Benetton Collective. 
we'd basically build a new town, asked Oming. Yes, one adjacent to a city. It would be more like a subdivision. That would allow you to define what you need as opposed to us guessing at it. We would work with any town builders you have. Yulzit's eyes narrowed. Why wouldn't we just live in one of your cities? That option is up to you, said Audinetis. However, you would need to adjust to our culture and learn how everything works. We do have temporary places for that. However, with the size of your group, we have found it's better to let them design what they want while having access to the city. Zillerich wagged a finger. We could build our own Fedoria. Tarek smiled. I like that. What would we provide in return? Audinetta stared at him. Nothing. I mean, you do all that for us without expecting anything in return? Audinetta's eyes glowed gold. Of course. You're humans. Are there aliens in the collective? asked Zillerich. Definitely. Although a majority of our collective is human, and they have unique rights compared to others. Unique rights? asked Oming. Audinetis nodded. The Senate is composed of various groups, but per our founding, slightly over 70% is human. Oming furrowed his brow. That doesn't sound too fair to the aliens. I understand your confusion from an outsider's perspective. The Tarago Empire, the human civilization before ours, allowed equal access, and humans were eventually driven out of any leadership. That started the purge, and over half of humanity was wiped out before Everin and U4 stepped in. Everin raised a finger. There are still other human factions in the Milky Way galaxy, but they are mostly a city here and there. Audinetis stared at him. You never mentioned those factions before. There was never a need to. They are very far away from here. Herrix ran a hand over his mouth. Even so, wow, half of humanity? That sounds rough. Makes sense to prevent that from happening again. Our approach works. And not all humans are always united. Yulzit laughed. <laughs> Some things never change. It would seem so, said Audinetis. Everin swept his gaze around the table. Our next step will be to talk to the Benetton Senate, and assuming all is well, the resettlement can begin in two weeks. I think that will be enough time for everyone to have adjusted. Audinetis' eyes glowed purple. You'll be a welcome addition. I will say that after your meeting with the Senate, the case against the Gorkines needs to be presented. We'll do so, said Everin. I think we'd all like to attend that, said Herrix, gesturing around. That would be best, said Audinetis. I briefly viewed the visual feet of the Gorkines wiping away their involvement. He motioned at Everin. While I think your evidence is strong, it will take more to convince the Convax Federation. Everin's eyes glowed golden. I will invoke the Tarama. A bold choice. Eric's eyes narrowed. What's that? Everin pivoted toward him. It is what I mentioned before about going back in time to see events. The Convax Federation Assembly will form a special group made up of member civilizations to investigate the claims being made. In this case, I will take them to points in their history to verify weakened time travel, then show them the Gorkines' actions. The Tarama needs a sponsor, and I believe the Benetton Collective will agree to be that. Well, that should do it, said Yulzit. M tilted his head. It should provide irrefutable evidence at that point. The Gorkines will then be admonished. And what form does that take? asked Amanza. Audinetis grimaced. That will need to be determined. But at a minimum, their presence in several systems will be revoked. 
They'll also most likely suffer in trade and lose some representation. It may not seem like much to you, but those are heavy sanctions. They can burn in the Great Selector's flame for all I care, said Oming, scowling. Audinetta stared at him. What is the Great Selector? The entity that created humans. I see, said Audinetus. We've seen references to a great selector, and there is quite a bit of debate on what that was. Your explanation is interesting. Everin looked around the table. I believe we have enough to meet with the Benetton Senate. We can do so today, and when two weeks have passed, we'll start the resettlement process if there are no concerns. I like it, said Herrix. The others signaled their agreement. I have questions about this united planets, said Audinetus. Herrix eased back in his chair. Fire away. The mood in the room was much more relaxed. Humans were easy to read for M, and he could also hear their heartbeats. Audinetus had relaxed, and his eyes cycled through various colors when the question and answer session continued on. Am hoped there would be no complications in their next step, but he knew alien politics could be unstable. Chapter 10 Herrix enjoyed the discussion with Audinetus. They had talked so much it ran into lunch, and Audinetus got his first taste of a cheeseburger. His lack of knowledge of popular human foods made Herrix wonder how far apart the cultures were. Although cheeseburgers were an ancient, earthborn thing, most humans knew of it. Adonetus had left, and Herrix felt there was a good plan in place. It didn't seem like they would be refused into the Benetton Collective, and Adonetus had given them topics to consider in regard to resettlement. The new town idea resonated well with the others, and they had already begun drafting notes in a shared digital workspace. The Toravada had reached Colonus Prime and was headed to Gerardo, the capital city. Herrix liked that the United Planets was advanced, but what he saw in orbit was much further along. There was a human-made moon that orbited the planet, and the space between was busy. A shielding system protected both in a big bubble, and per the readouts, it would be able to handle relativistic missiles. The other standout aspect was the sheer number of drones. They handled maintenance on space structures, patrols, and a few broad items to ships. However, the most intriguing thing he saw was transportation beams coming from the planet to a special station. He was not sure on the physics used, but when someone stepped into a container, it shot them up the beam. How they did not get crushed intrigued him, and he was eager to learn more about that. The Torvada had been automatically registered when it approached the planet. Herrix figured that was some type of unique registration or signal. Nonetheless, they were descending toward Gerardo. He enjoyed seeing floating city districts. While he was aware of anti-gravity technology, this was on another level. It had the similar beams that served as transport conduits. Gerardo was an unusual-looking place in that it was more of an ecumenopolis or a planet-wide city. What stood out was the sheer amount of trees, small lakes, and parks built into the layout. It gave off a forest-like feel, but he didn't see any large stretches of forests. Massive structures jutted into the air in several areas, and the Torvata highlighted them as city centers. He had thought they would be landing at one of the many spaceports outlined on the ground— but they instead flew toward a pad on the Gerardo city center. A nanocloud escorted them in and enveloped the area while forming a barely visible tunnel to the landing platform. He suspected they could do a lot of damage to a hostile ship if need be. Once they landed, Herrix and his command crew joined Everin and M outside the Toravada. The nanocloud was still present and had opened a path to a solid door where two humanoid robots with liquid metal skin stood silent. Herrick still saw readings from Everin and M, and they had detected that the metallic posts spread around were beam turrets. The security of the place was tight, and Herrick wondered if his crew could use any of the technology for the town they'd build. Let's go, said Everin as he strolled out with his hands behind his back. Although this was a meeting they had been invited to, Herrick's was still cautious. 
It made him feel better to have Everin around, especially when he walked with confidence. It was like he radiated an aura of it. M also moved without concern, and that contributed to the group's mood. After reaching the solid wall, it dissipated into a doorway. The smooth tunnels they entered fascinated Herricks. There was no central illumination source, and instead light filtered in via small holes on the ground, ceiling, and walls. He jumped when a hologram appeared in front of them. It resembled Audinetus somewhat, except this human was larger with a slightly different face. Everin tossed out an orb. This is so everyone understands what is being said. Understood. Follow me, said the hologram. The silence outside of the group's footsteps unnerved Herricks. He wasn't sure if there was some active noise cancellation going on, but it was unnaturally quiet. Yulzit had cleared his throat, and it was like he had yelled, causing some to flinch. After a ten-minute walk, they reached another solid wall that dissipated. The U-shaped room they entered was empty and similar to the hallways. There were miniature holes spread everywhere. The hologram had them pause near the entrance. Herricks and his command crew were startled when stepped platforms three levels deep materialized around them, following the contours of the room. Although they were holograms, they looked real. Square cells highlighted side by side on each platform level, and members of the Benetton Senate displayed in them. They all wore a white robe with a black tunic, but what stood out to Herricks was the patch-like insignia on the upper right chest. Each member had a different one, and per the readout from Everin and M, the symbols were emblems designating the planetary system they were from. One member's hologram formed before the group. The cell he had been in now glowed brighter than the others. It was an efficient way to tell at a glance who had the floor. It also helped that a banner identifying the person hovered above them. This was Senate member Garactus, and the system he represented was large based on the statistics shown on the banner, Everin and M. It's always good to see you both, even in new forms, said Garactus. Everin placed his right arm across his stomach and slightly bowed. Likewise, Garactus's eyes turned blue when he dipped his head. We appreciate that you contacted us before coming and outlined the situation. We've already discussed the resettlement and have approved of it based on some outcomes. Of course. What do you need? asked Everin. We'd like you to send us the video evidence in regard to the Gorkines. We've already scanned the humans with you on your arrival and have verified that they are indeed human, but from an earlier evolutionary period. Of course. And we'll handle that. All video feeds have been transferred in regard to the Gorkine accident, said M. Very well said Garactus. Whoever speaks for the human group, please step forward. Herricks cleared his throat and cast a sidelong glance at his command group, then stepped forward. He slapped his right fist to his upper left chest. I'm Captain Herricks Trellis of the UPS Alpaca. Garactus walked around him, then stood back in front, Welcome to the Benetton Collective. We are sorry to hear what happened to you with the Gorkines. I understand you lost a significant portion of your crew. Herricks grimaced. Yeah, I see, said Garactus. And do you wish for the Gorkines to be punished? I don't know fully what the justice system is here, but their actions require justice to be served. Yulzit scowled. Damn right! The room stared at him. He shrugged, just speaking my mind. Sorry, no need to apologize. It's what we all think, said Herricks. I don't know how to proceed on that front. Everin looked at Garactus. I have requested a Convax Federation Assembly meeting. I will invoke Tarama there if needed to prove that we can time travel then show them the incident in question. Garactus eyed him. Unfortunately, visual evidence can be altered with ease. 
While you have no need to prove who you are or what you can do to us, I think Tarama would be appropriate to convince the other Federation members. We can assist you with what points in time to visit, based on the three delegates chosen. Thank you. It will take a week or so before we can convene a meeting. Caractus faced Terex. At this point, you are officially Benetton Collective members, and your resettlement has been approved. We can provide you with a liaison to help you start the building process. Herrix repeated the United Planets salute. We are honored. He liked how fast the meeting had gone. There were no long rituals or processions. It was just get down to the topic at hand, resolve it, then move on. It felt unusual to be a member of a new human group, and part of him was sad that the United Planets was not around anymore. He would need to brush up on the Convax Federation and see who had what standing with the Benetton Collective. The rest of his command crew seemed relieved, and several Senate members had beamed down to talk with them. This meeting had been an informal meet-and-greet, essentially. Herricks was eager to see the Gorkines punished, but he was equally excited about moving and starting the next chapter of his and the crew's life. It had been a week since Herricks and his command crew had met with the Benetton Senate. A lot had been accomplished since then, particularly when it came to the living space they would be building. Charmas had been the Benetton liaison, and she was a ball of energy compared to the other Benettons Herricks had met. It highlighted the two extremes of Benetton personalities. She had brought a team of engineers to meet with Oming and his group. Herricks had thought they would work in a virtual lab somewhere, but instead they worked in one of the Torvada's hollow rooms, and they went full scale. This allowed Herricks and others to fly around the new settlement and test out various systems without requiring a brain hookup to a digital environment. He liked the large central park where community events could occur. The town had four quadrants, with a circular water area in the middle. Around the park were units that sat in the center of a plot surrounded by plant life. He had found it interesting that the Benetton engineers pointed out potential issues, but he suspected they probably didn't understand the general desire of his crew for open space. Although they did have nature weaved into the city, they seemed to prefer condensed areas. The housing units varied in size, but most were single or two-story. There were underground components, and even small towers that allowed the residents to view things from above. The most surprising aspect of it was that the engineers said their nanoswarms could build all the plant life in four days. Herrix was okay with that, but he wanted to wait until the meeting with the Convax Federation was done, and a week longer for the crew to be on the Torvada would be okay. He was now in the command area with his command group. It was 11 o'clock a.m., and everyone had a late breakfast and was ready for the next step. Everin sat in his command chair, while M had taken up residence in the workstation to the right. The Torvada had opened a portal and had flown to the designated space base that orbited a lone star. The station was heavily defended with swarms of defense platforms and multiple layers of shielding. Unlike meeting the Benetton Senate, delegates met in person here. After docking... Herrix and his command crew had followed Everin and M to a small room outside a massive coliseum like area. The Convex Federation delegates had already arrived and received the videos of the event. Herrix assumed it would be an ironclad case, but Adonetis had mentioned it could be twisted. Herrix expected no less from the Gorkines, and he would need to control himself when he saw them. After fifteen minutes, a humanoid android peeked into the room and indicated for them to follow him. Herrix widened his eyes at how large the ground area was in the Colosseum. The stands were packed with delegates, and each group of representatives had their own custom seating environment. The range of aliens astounded him. He had seen many in the United Planets, but this assembly dwarfed that. Most were humanoid but he saw insectoid, avian, reptilian, water-based, and even gas races in unique containers. What surprised him the most was the presence of several machine races. He wondered how they kept from coming to a logical conclusion that they were supreme, a problem the United Planets had even with the android nation being a model group. 
One race resembled floating cylinders, but when he looked closer, he saw they were small ships. Their crews must have been tiny. In the center was a massive black and silver pillar. Herricks was not sure what it represented or did, but he and the others followed the android to about twenty feet away from it. Welcome, boomed the pillar. Your case was sent to all delegates for consideration when this meeting was scheduled. Thank you for having us, said Everin. The pillar pulsed with lights. They have voted that there is insufficient evidence for admonishment or for an investigation. The planet in question was checked, and no Gorkine presence was detected. Your visual evidence came from only one source, yours, and we require a minimum of two, with one being from neither the accused nor the accuser, especially when it concerns an assault as you have described. Everin frowned. I see. Then I invoke Tarama. The delegates murmured. Do you have a sponsor? asked the pillar. The Benetton Collective's stand highlighted, and Garactus's hologram projected next to Everin. The Benetton Collective sponsors this. Very well, said the pillar. What is the nature of your Tarama? Everin put up three fingers. I will take three delegates of your choosing to various points in their civilization's history to verify I can time travel. Once that is ascertained, we'll go to the Gorkine event and allow the delegation to see it for themselves. This is outrageous, said Thazis, a Gorkine delegate appearing to the right of the group. Time travel only exists with rifts, and there were none in that area. My ship, the Torvada, can time travel, said Everin. That is why I will prove that first before going to the event. If the Gorkines have nothing to hide, then this shouldn't be an issue or concern. Thazis sneered. There won't be anything to find, and this is just an attempt to smear us. Then a vote will be taken on the Tarama, said the Pillar. Herrick's heart pumped when the Pillar pulsed. He figured the vote was happening. After a few minutes, the Pillar said, Your Tarama has been granted. Three delegates from outside the sponsor and accused will accompany you and report back. Excellent, said Everin. We can go whenever they are ready. They will meet you at your ship in 14 hours, 36 minutes, 8 seconds, and 588 milliseconds. Everin slightly bowed. We'll be ready. He turned to the group. Let's go. Herrick chuckled at the translator's time conversion. It sounded odd, but he was sure it was accurate. He was curious who the three delegates would be and what race they would come from. They held the power to punish the Gorkines, and it disturbed him that it took a lot of pull just to get an investigation. Without Everin's and M's help or assistance from the Benetton Collective, it would have been next to impossible to serve justice, and that assumed they would have been rescued in the first place. The wait seemed long, but perhaps that was due to limitations from the delegates. Everin and M were calm about everything, but Herrick and his crew were excited to get going. There was justice to serve. Chapter 11 M observed Herrick and his command crew yawning when they streamed into the conference room. It was 1 o'clock a.m. the next day, and that was usually when humans would have slept. The three delegates would be arriving in thirty minutes for the Tahrama. It intrigued them that humans kept to a twenty-four-hour cycle for the most part, despite expanding out to planets with different configurations. It was standard on United Planets space stations in the time period Herrick's was from. Everin sat at the head of the table while others got coffee and a light snack. After everyone was seated, he looked around. I know sleeping earlier to be refreshed now is unusual but hopefully you are well rested. Herrick sipped from his cup. 
I got a good nine hours in and feel great. The beds here are the most relaxing thing ever. Yulzit lifted his coffee mug. Hear, hear. The important thing is we're ready for justice to be served to the Gorkines. And it will be had, said Everin. Do you wish to see the three delegates who will be coming? Oming shrugged. Sure, why not? Very well, said Everin, tapping the surface console. A projection popped up over the table. Emma analyzed the strange-looking alien. It was a thin humanoid classified as a male and stood around eight feet tall. Black light armor covered the body, and two long black tendrils snaked out from its shoulders. It had four arms, and each extended hand ended with two long, clawed fingers. But there were two other fingers on each side, and an opposable appendage near the wrist that was opposite the clawed fingers. The face had pieces of bone mixed in with dark gray skin, and a metal plate covered the head. Where the eyes would be were glowing white dots. This is Tremu, said Everin. He has four other parts to his name that are represented by cliques, but Tremu is the official name he uses with other races. He's a member of the Galcricus, a recent addition to the Convex Federation. From what is known of their species, they tend to be aloof and dismissive, and Tremu is no exception. How does he feel about the Benetton Collective? asked Amanza. From the videos I've seen, he looks down on humans as an inferior race due to their heavy cybernetic integration. Herrick shrugged. Well, we only need to show him a point in time, then go to the Gorkine event and we'll probably never see him again. A good outlook, said M. The next projection intrigued him. It was a humanoid female alien who stood around five feet tall. Her green-scaled skin showed on her face, and ridges rolled back over her head. She had natural armor mixed in with light armor covering most of her body. She had three eyes, two green and one blue on her forehead, along with a mouth of sharp teeth. This is Gamus, and she represents the Omericats, a reptilian race, said Everin. She is highly intelligent, and their race is one of the most advanced in the Convax Federation. She looks tough, said Oming, and brought up a data label and expanded it. They are dense and much stronger than they might appear. Zilrich smirked. Got it. Don't piss her off. A good tactic, said M. She is the friendliest of the three coming, said Everin. The projection changed again. M studied a humanoid robot that turned out to be a shell for the gaseous species inside it. The body was advanced, and the container was a large cylinder with small tendrils going throughout the body. He had seen that before on Earth when a gas-based species had crossed over to Earth from a failing dimension, and the ruling power at the time, the Helians, had given them bodies to survive in. They then existed as managers, essentially enforcers for the Helians. And this is Exanar, said Everin. He is a member of a gas-based species called the Frotchen, and he's quite lively and enjoys others. Note that although I refer to him as he, the Frotchen don't have the concept of gender. They're all the same in that regard. First time seeing a gas race, said Tarek. Sure will be interesting, said Yulzit. M's mood analysis algorithm suggested the crew was uneasy. Perhaps it was due to the unknown nature of the delegates, or maybe it was related to them possibly denying time travel was possible, thus invalidating the investigation. The images of each delegate now hovered in front of everyone, and Tremu garnered the most attention. The delegates arrived thirty minutes later. Everin and Am stood on the ramp, while Herricks and his command crew waited inside the command area. Am understood this setup was so the delegates did not feel pressured before boarding. It was easier to deal with meeting two rather than ten. Welcome to the Toravada, said Everin, slightly bowing. We're honored to be here, said Gamis, baring her teeth. Everin and Em repeated her action. I'm so excited to be here, said Exenar. He danced around in a circle. Tremu scoffed at Exenar then scowled at Everin. I'm here, 
Let's hope you deliver. That's the intent, said Everin. Please follow me. The delegates assembled in the command area. The seating had been rearranged so that Everin's command chair and M's workstation were in the back. The left side had seating for Herrick's and his command crew, and it was angled 45 degrees from where Everin sat. The other side had three seats for the delegates. That left some space in the middle. Everyone was in the middle for the moment, with Everin and M providing a buffer between Herrick's crew and the delegates. Everin named each of Herrick's command crew while facing the delegates. As for the delegates, this is Gamis of the Americats, said Everin, gesturing at her. It's a pleasure to meet you, she said. She flashed her sharp teeth. Herrick's crew jumped, except for Herrick's, Yulzid, and Zillerich. Likewise, said Herrick's, who then bared his teeth. The rest of the crew did the same. The next delegate is Exenar of the Frachin, said Everin. Exenar did a handstand, twirled in place, then did a flip back to his feet. It's great to meet you all, Yulzid burst out laughing. The rest of Herrick's command crew stared at him. I'm sorry, but that was funny, he said. Exenar pointed at him with both hands. He understands. We're bonded now. I guess so. No disrespect was intended. Your laughter is what I sought, said Exenar, his robot face smiling. Indeed, said Everin. Our last delegate is Tremu of the Galcricus. Tremu sneered. This... Introduction is a waste of time. I don't need introduced or wish to know the others. Herricks raised his head. I'm sorry you feel that way, but we greet you nonetheless. Damn right, said Yulzit. The rest of the crew verbally affirmed Herricks' statement. Tremu harumphed. Gamis and Exenar focused on Herricks as if they were trying to understand him. Perhaps they were comparing him to how the Benettons did introductions. Everin gestured around. Let's be seated, and we can begin. M took his seat at his workstation. He had the three locations to go to and what to look for. Although that should validate time travel, the delegates might have other agendas. He didn't think they did, but they were also unknown to him. Hopefully, these historical visits would be enough. Herricks was not fully sure what to make of the delegates. Gamis was the closest to what he was used to dealing with when it came to alien species. Exenar had been a welcome surprise, and although Herricks had been able to control his laughter, Exenar's dancing had brought a smile to his face. Tremu's outward contempt annoyed Herricks. He was not sure why Tremu had been chosen as a delegate. Our first visit is to a moment in Galcricus history when a supervolcano destroyed their planet, although they were able to save a large portion of their population. Many were lost, said Everin. M. Take us to twenty minutes before the time coordinates given by Tremu. Acknowledged. Why twenty minutes earlier? asked Tremu. That's the time it takes for the Torvada to go from orbit to the ground, said Everin. Tremu harumphed, rather slow for an advanced aircraft, perhaps, but the Torvada has many options available to it, such as time travel that other ships don't. Tremu continued to be ice cold in his interactions. Herricks hoped he would not have to deal with him in the future. The Torvada ascended. Herricks continued to observe the delegates as the Torvada left the station. Tremu made a few snide remarks, touting Galcricus' superiority. It intrigued Herix that Gamus had indicated their civilization was more advanced, something Tremu quietly acknowledged. Tremu showed outright contempt for Exenar, though. The Torvada opened a portal and flew through. A satellite around the planet confirmed it was the current day of the place where they needed to be. Do you concur this is the planet to visit? asked Everin, gesturing at Tremu. It is. But we were eighty light years away. What was that portal? Everin smiled. The Torvada can open dimensional rifts that allow for traversing great distances. And now we time travel. Right? Said Tremu with an amused look. 
indeed. Everything outside the Torvada faded away to pure darkness, then eased back in. Herrick grinned when Gamus gasped and Exenar shrieked. Tremu stood, his gaze fixed forward. Another satellite was scanned, but it was much more primitive technologically compared to the one from the present. Do you confirm we are in the past? asked Everin. We aren't at the location on the planet, said Tremu. Not yet. The Torvada descended to a volcano that belched smoke. A ship has been detected, said M. Perhaps a scout craft, said Exenar. Tremu's eyes narrowed. Not with that configuration. That's a Kotri fighter. Gamus faced him. You wanted to verify they were present, if time travel was true. Why not? Are you planning to enact hostilities with them? asked Exenar. Tremu glared at him. That remains to be seen. He stared at the screen as the countdown to his time coordinates approached zero. Observe. That fighter dropped something in the volcano. The Torvada ascended when the volcano went ballistic. And now there is no debate as to Kotri involvement. Note that although this was meant to be a verification step, your use of it is questionable, said Everin. Tremu shrugged. I don't see why this step can't serve multiple purposes. It's efficient. Tremu had used this outing as an attempt to gain something. Herrix suspected that whoever the Kotri were, they were about to be embroiled in a fight. Are you satisfied with this step? asked Everin. Yes. And that's what's important for you? said Tremu. Everin eyed him. Very well. M, take us to the time coordinates Exenar has set. Acknowledged. The Torvada reached low orbit, then opened a portal, flew through, and jumped forward in time. Two ships detected. One is of Frachin design, the other of Cortican design, said M. Exenar stood and stared at the two ships in deep space, our first meeting with another race. Those ship specifications match what is expected. We never saw it from this angle, but I can confirm that we time-traveled. Excellent, said Everin. M, take us to Gamus's coordinates. The Torvada opened another portal and flew through, then jumped back in time. Herrix studied the green planet. There were patches of water spread throughout, but there was a higher percentage of land— the Torvada descended through cloud cover, and after twenty minutes it hovered above a massive rally of Omericats. The interior shielding displayed a zoomed-in window of the speaker. Gamus gasped. That's Handy Guldu, our first world president. We had banished our old religious sex and united as a planet. This was the pivotal moment when we turned toward the stars. Herrix listened with interest to a part of the speech being given. Gamus sat entranced as she stared at the screen. This is incredible. This speech was over eight hundred years ago. She looked at Everin with hopeful eyes. Is there any way we could record this... M glanced at her. I could record it. Everin half smiled. He is volunteering to fly down and cover the speech. Then we pick him up after. This would be phenomenal, she said. You may proceed, M. Acknowledged. The Torvada returned to orbit, hopped back in time, then descended to before the speech began. M flew out in orb mode and exited the Torvada. It then ascended to orbit, jumped a few hours ahead, then traveled back down, and returned and entered his body. I have sent you the recording. Gamus's eyes lit up. We can't thank you enough for this. I can confirm. We time traveled. Then we go to the Gorkine incident, said Everin. 
Herrick's could not help but notice that each delegate had received something of value out of the time travel verification step. He wondered how it would impact the present when they returned. His stomach churned when the Torvado went through several stops. The first was the crossover from the time period he knew to this one. The second was the aftermath of the crash. And the third was the Gorkine cruiser when it wiped the camp. Gamus seemed disgusted by it all, and even the usually excited Exener was muted. Tremu observed in silence. The Torvada moved back to the current time, and one minute after they had left the space station where they picked up the delegates. That was horrendous, said Gamus. There's no argument as to what happened. I'm in agreement, said Exenar. They need to be dealt with. While the other two delegates had impressions Herrick's expected, he was not sure what Tremu would say, given his attitude in general. Tremu addressed the command crew. What was done to your crew is unacceptable. We may be new to the Convax Federation, but actions like this by the Gorkines are a threat. They must be punished. Herrick's relaxed some. He suspected that Tremu's observation would carry more weight than the other delegates. If anything, it may provide his race some assurance that justice was being dealt. The delegates stood. We will give our findings to the assembly, said Gamus. She faced Herrick's command crew. I'm sorry to have seen what befell your crew. Justice will be served. Thank you, said Herrick's. She exited with Exenar and Tremu in tow. Hopefully we can focus on our new settlement now, said Herrix. I can't wait to hear what happens to the Gorkines, said Yulzit. They can't hide from this now. Zillerich smiled at Everin. Thank you for getting us to this point. This is more than we could have asked for. It beats dying on that planet, said Tarek. I concur, said Everin. I don't know how long their deliberations on what they will do with the Gorkines will last, but you and your group can determine some things, like the planet and city you want to build at. You've already started the design aspect of your settlement, so if there is anything else that needs to be done, you have time to do so. Oming grinned. Our new settlement is far more advanced than anything we could have built in our time, and I thought we were already advanced back then. We even have a special underground transportation tunnel into the city that allows quick access. I saw that, said Amanza. Our medical facility will be wonderful. It may take some time to get used to a small army of androids, but that doesn't seem to be too much of an issue in this era. And this will be a great place for the kids to grow up in, said Tarek. Herrick sensed their excitement. He was ready for the next chapter and still struggled to believe that what was left of his crew not only survived, but now had a chance to thrive. His command group had mentioned they wanted to honor Everin in some fashion. What form that would take, he did not know. But he was glad to have the opportunity to focus on things like that instead of cave creatures or the Gorkines. Chapter 12 Herrick's heart pounded as he stood with his command crew at the small spaceport that was built outside their settlement. It had been a month since Everin and M had left, and all the survivors had moved into their new subdivision. It was called Fredoria by unanimous vote. Herricks wished Everin and M had stuck around, but they said they would return a month later to see how everything was going. The subdivision had been built in a week, and everyone had left the Torvada, there were some initial concerns with some services, but those were ironed out over the next few weeks. The spaceport came last, but it had a direct connection to Fredoria. It was not big and could only support two large ships or multiple smaller ones, but it served as a good place for travel shuttles. The Torvada always had a registered spot, and this would be the first time it was used. Herricks loved the new android and robot workers whom he had trouble distinguishing between at times. They handled maintenance and dock scheduling. They also were woven throughout Fredoria, and every family had one to help out with things. He grinned when the Torvada came into view. He was used to it always being cloaked, but there was no need for that here. The others were visibly excited, 
and he suspected Everin and M would enjoy the grand tour. A celebration was scheduled that night in the center open area, with them as the featured guests. Caractus, Gamus, Adernetus, and Exenar would also be in attendance. Tremu was invited, but he declined to come. The Torvada landed, and a moment later, Everin and M exited. Herrix slapped his fist to his chest, along with the others. Everin and M reciprocated, but M went to high-five everyone. Everin gazed off into the distance. You've made a lot of progress. Definitely, said Herrix. Care for a tour? I'd like that. I would as well, said M. Herrix waved forward. Come on. As they walked, Everin glanced at Herrix. How has integration been? Mostly quiet. Quiet, asked Yulzit. We had some incidents, but they got smoothed over. M tilted his head. What type of incidents? Yulzit sighed. Well, as you know, there are a lot of aliens on this planet. A group from here went into the city to experience it, and they came across a Gorkine shop. You can imagine their surprise. I see, said Everin. It would not be unusual for a Gorkine shop to be there, although it most likely would elicit a strong reaction. Yeah. Those from our camp got into a physical altercation, but it was shut down fast. Everin placed his hands behind his back as he strolled. I'm sure the Benettons understood. They did. And apparently some enjoyed watching us attack the aliens, said Yulzit. Zillerich shook his head. There appears to be a strong anti-alien sentiment around. We unwittingly now have a despicable segment of the population that hails us as symbols of hate and their struggle. They loved our hostility and fighting. I see, said Everin. They approached the first group of buildings. Herricks moved his hand in an arc. Despite that, Fredoria, what we call our settlement, has been developing nicely. This is our medical area, and it's packed with the latest amazing technology. I love it, said Amanza. I also run it. I look forward to seeing it in more detail, said Everin. Any time. They walked toward another set of buildings. Tarek smiled big. It might not look like much, but this is our education facilities. This campus allows anyone, including children, to get whatever knowledge is appropriate, then experience it digitally or in nanoswarm rooms. Everin studied the structures. Do you use the Benetton's approach to education? We do. Although we have nanobots inside us to some degree, we never had much in the brain area. That's not an issue with the Benetton's technology. Just swallow a pill and you have information on a wide variety of topics. It can even be released over time based on age. The kids love it. Interesting. They moved to the large central area. Herrick grinned at a statue. That's you and M. It might bring unwarranted attention, said Everin. Terex snorted. After all we've been through, we'll gladly deal with anyone who has an issue. He's right, said Herrix. This was a vote by everyone, and there has been a rise in pregnancies since coming here, and Everin is a very popular name. He smiled at M. As for you, we've named this M's Park, and your name is used in a variety of ways, from replicator patterns to medical procedures. I'm honored, said M. Zillerich slapped his back. You're a hero, just like Everin. We wouldn't be here without you two. We even have Heroes Day, a new holiday that celebrates you both. I'm happy you have a second chance, said Everin. Yeah, we are too, said Yulzit. They laughed. A woman and a kid walked up and hugged M. Then Everin. Several others also approached. Herrick gazed off into the distance. If we want to continue the tour, we should move. Otherwise, everyone will hug you. The woman squeezed his arm before she left with the child. The others dipped their heads after stepping back. Herrick was glad they understood. There would be a big celebration that night where everyone could see them. It also showed how respectful they were of Everin's and M's presence in that they gave them some space once they saw the group was on a tour. 
The group walked to a large warehouse. Oming stepped forward. This is our production facility. We can create anything we need up to a shuttle. Thanks to the Benettons, we also have a bay in space where we can build bigger ships. This is also where we do robot maintenance and house our nano swarms. Impressive, said Everin. Yeah, and it's also a good training ground for everyone to become familiar with the newer technology. Em glanced at him. This is your second home. Tarek laughed. <laughs> Some would say first. Oming grinned. Herrix led them to another large cube-shaped building. And this is our town office. He moved his finger out in an arc at the others. This is where we work from, and we also have liaisons from other areas, including a Benetton official. Everything has been orderly and calm since this was established. I calculate that the few incidents you had were smoothed out here, said M. Oh, yes. We couldn't ask for more gracious hosts, and I'm sure we'll adapt to Benetton culture over time. Everin half smiled at him, and they will learn about United Planets culture. Zellerich chuckled. We've already had several historical research groups visit us. They want to know everything, and we actually made waves by declaring Earth as humanity's origin. I assume you will resolve many mysteries for them, said Everin. Yeah, although their concept of family is strange. You refer to them not having marriage, Zillerich grimaced. That's it. In the United Planets, we marry into a group, usually three males and four females, and kids are raised by the group and the government. Here, they don't have groups or the like. They just find someone who would create a child, have at it, and then they move on. It's not a pleasurable experience from what I've heard. Nonetheless, the kid is handled by the state, although it's mostly by androids. Yulzit snorted. <laughs> they don't do the parent bonding thing, that's for sure, much less with each other. However, they strongly bond their identity as a Benetton. I understand, said Everin. To the Benettons, it's an inefficient use of time to prioritize one individual over another. They treat everyone as equals, and for kids they receive a universal education. It will be interesting to observe the Benettons when they learn more about United Planets culture— We'll see, said Herrix. The Benettons truly live up to their cyborg nature. A good third of their bodies is machinery components, so I'm not too surprised their culture reflects some of that. Everin smiled. Then they can see another version of humanity to learn from. Yulzit crooked a thumb at Oming. He tried to flirt with a Benetton, and she had no idea what he was trying to do. She asked him to speak more efficiently. Oming shrugged. Yeah, but it worked, eventually. They really like bluntness, even on topics like that. Then it sounds like relations are going better than I expected, said Everin. Herrix was glad Everin and M had come back to check on how everything was going. It meant a lot to the survivors to see Everin, and for Herrix it was personal. It boggled his mind that saving his ancestor led to this exact moment. One small change in the past rippled out this far. Although, given the span of time Everin and M could go, this was most likely negligible. Herrix was happy to be alive and to be offered a second chance. His group's future was bright, and he was anxious to start exploring it. A part of him was still sad they couldn't go back to their own time, but he understood why. He gazed around at the others, who laughed at a joke M had told. Herrick's group would help him usher in integration with a new version of humanity, and he was excited to see where that led. It did him good to see that humanity had survived this far into the future, even if it was an iteration he was unfamiliar with. The Gorkin incident couldn't be erased, but he was determined to show that his crew could grow and move on. They would serve as ambassadors for the United Planets. There was a lot of work to be done and he was thankful to have the chance to do it. M had enjoyed the previous day, which ended with a long celebration in the Fredorian open area. Herricks had been the master of ceremonies, and although it was brief, he did a good job. A majority of the time had been spent milling with the assembled crowd that turned out to be 79.7% of the survivors. M had been able to talk with many, 
including those who didn't just want to touch his arm, shoulder, or back. The same applied to Everin. There had been a vast banquet of food and drinks, and it didn't surprise him that there was no worry of insects. A nanoswarm hung over the area to ensure that. Due to the length of the planet's orbit around the sun, it hadn't gotten dark. The celebration ran to 2 o'clock a.m. Earth time, a metric M had internalized. Like with most human ceremonies, there was alcohol, and after most had cleared, there were some left that sang and danced. A few individuals had gotten violent and mentioned anti-Gorkin messages, but they were restrained. Am and Everin were now in front of the Toravada. It was time to leave, and Herricks and his command crew were approaching. While they seemed to joke around as they walked, Am had learned that humans could show one emotion while harboring another— there was a sadness about the group, from quick frowns to scrunched faces when looking forward. Their heartbeats were accelerated, and their breathing had increased. He concluded they were nervous, and joking was a way of releasing it. Herrix and his command crew stood in front of Everin. We enjoyed the celebration, but it's time for us to go, said Everin. Herrix frowned. We know, and wish you could stay. But given what you did for us, there's probably others out there who could use your help. Indeed so. Tarek's eyes misted. We'll never forget your efforts. We're only here because of you two. Everin laid a hand on his shoulder. The Toravada helped as well. However, you have a chance now for something new. M and I will visit you all sometime in the future. You'll be welcomed with open arms, said Zilrich. Damn right said Yulzit. Oming furrowed his brow. So you're both going to Earth in 2014 now? That is the current plan, said Everin. To think you were on Earth back then and the things you must have seen in our evolution, said Amanza. It's amazing. Em smiled. It's been intriguing to watch humans evolve. Amanza motioned at him. Did you have others travel with you before? Humans, that is. Yes, said Em, frowning. They didn't survive, but neither did we. Her eyes widened. Ah, uh, are you going to get new companions, then? We shall see, said Everin. Herrix laughed. <laughs> I already know your journeys can get pretty hectic. I'm sure you'll have more in your future. Whenever you want a place to unwind... Consider visiting us. Noted, said Everin, dipping his head. M high-fived everyone while Everin did the United Planets salute. Several of the crew's eyes were red, and Amanza and Zillerich wiped a tear away. He embraced M, while Tarek and the others hugged Everin. Before Everin and M left, Everin swept his gaze across Herrick's group. I wish you good luck in this new chapter of your journey. Thank you. Travel safe, said Herrix. Everin and M bowed slightly, performed a final look, then boarded the Toravada. Part of M wanted to stick around for fifty years and watch the survivors integrate with Benetton society. However, there were other summonses to attend to, and going to Earth was a big step from what they had been doing. They assembled in the command center. The Torvada ascended as Herrick's command crew waved. M's inner orb pulsed erratically, which he classified as sad. Herrick's crew had become his friends, Zilrich in particular. They now had a chance at a better life, and it pleased M to have been a part of that. After the Torvada reached low orbit, he scrutinized Everin. Are you ready to go to Earth now? Everin paused, then nodded. I am. Let's go. Em stared at him. Have you forgotten something? Everin smiled. Everything is as it should be. Acknowledged. The End This has been The Lost Ship, The Everin Chronicles 2, Prequel Written by Adair Hart Narrated by Michael Wolfe. Copyright 2023 by Adair Hart. Production copyright by Adair Hart.